Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, concert reader Scott Dilly, and I'm joined, as always, by King newbie Matt Freeman. Just a, a nice, a nice guy. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, whatever. This week, <laughs> the stand continues with chapters 10 through 20. Captain Trips continues to make its way across the United States as Larry, Franny, and Nick... Li- Nick's lives get tossed into the superflu tornado. Also, we meet uh, we meet Lloyd. Lloyd, who I mean, he's just just a great guy, right? Like he's yeah. real swell. Yeah, lo- everybody we meet lately has just been a swell, just solid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we'll we'll talk about Lloyd. Mm-hmm. Matt, what did you think overall of this week's reading? Uh, you know, once again, um, continues to be you know King at his best, really. Uh, in terms of character work specifically, in terms of getting to know these interesting, complex, very human, very real feeling characters. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a lot of really interesting beats that that we're just going to talk about endlessly today. I, I kind of, it's kind of daunting actually how many like sequential chapters there are where, where you're like, Oh man, we got to talk about this forever. Yeah, uh, it just happens uh, over and over. The the prep work was really difficult this week because I agree with you. It's just like I, I felt like I was 10, 15 pages into the script and I'm two chapters in. I'm just like, oh, oh no, oh no. There's a whole lot to talk about here. Um, and I I'm totally with you on this, man. I mean, I've always known this, but the fact that King spends so much time here at the beginning of this book really setting up these characters and and, and we're kind of watching the world slowly collapsed to Captain Trips. Like it's not, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say a lot of this book takes place in a post um, Captain Trips world, right? Uh, and yet we are spending so much time here, uh, you know, kind of watching as society slowly is pushed to the brink, and and watching as this thing slowly invades the lives of our characters, who have been each individually dealing with a bunch of shit on their own completely unrelated to the super flu yeah well mild spoiler for something that i'm probably going to repeat later but i think that that king's beginnings are usually the strongest parts of his stories yeah um not to say that i don't think the rest of this book is going to be awesome i'm sure it will but i think that when you're when he's introducing you to the characters and introducing you to the conflict and the setting and everything that's generally when i'm having the most fun Mm -hmm. um and so i don't mind that we're spending a lot of time in this part of the story yeah, I don't remember if I said this last week or not, um, but obviously I think The Stand is a, a masterpiece, you know, from beginning to end. But book one, uh, the, the the part of the book we're in right now is I, I think I would put it up against – it by itself, I would put it up against – the best of American literature, frankly, I, uh-huh. I think it's just and you'll see as we go over the next few weeks, it's just a, a mastercraft of of storytelling. I think it's wonderful. I love this entire book, but this part that we're in right now that we're in the middle of right now is is, in my opinion, the best of the best of the best. So totally with you on that. Yeah, I feel you. All right. Um, we do have some quick announcements before we get into the uh, the show this week. Uh, first of all, I'm under the weather. As you can probably tell by the sound of my voice, uh, I'm feeling fine. It's just my voice is all messed up, which is, let me tell you, Matt, a fun experience to, to hap- happen while you're reading this book when both you and your son are sick and you're just like, oh, yeah, there's a tickle in the back of my throat. Oh, was that my son coughing over in the corner? It's <laughs> not a not a fun experience. But no. I'm here and I'm ready to talk for two hours, which will do great things for my throat. Yeah, right. I'm sure. I'm sure that our several podcasts this week will will just be really good for your health. <laughs> On top of that, though, we just wanted to say thank you. Um, the response to last week was uh, wonderful. Um, we kind of we kind of were hoping that it would be a very positive response because we know this is a very beloved book and we've always done pretty well numbers wise. But I think last week on our Thursday we had our single best download day ever. Right? That's true. Yep. Right? Yep, that's true. Um, which is wild and wonderful and, and we're so thankful for all of you so thank you for for getting excited and thank you for sharing your excitement with other people because i think we had a bunch of first time listeners tune in last week um so we just wanted to say thank you to everyone listening to the show uh last week is really great and we're excited to keep it going yeah and welcome to the newcomers too yeah yeah um matt we gotta talk about phlegm <laughs> we um, do we gotta uh, talk briefly talk about phlegm 
So I said the word fledgum yes last week. Uh-huh. Um, I don't I don't know why I I did that. I know it's pronounced phlegm. I I just you know you're reading the text and you see this word and you just you just say it like it like it's spelled right. Yeah. I don't know why I I don't I don't know why but I said it and. I think that I think you know, like everyone's focusing on me and the dumb thing that I did here. Uh-huh. I don't think people are are focusing on you enough who just stood there uh-huh. and once again well, let it happen. Let me without saying anything. Let me just mildly defend myself because okay. I did. There's there's this thing that happens, especially when somebody's reading something where if if they're speaking with confidence and for a second it throws you and you're like, wait a minute, am I the one who's wrong? And and then yeah. in the time that it takes you to think like no I'm I'm definitely not um, the moment has passed and then it would be kind of weird to go back but and I'll also say that I did inform you of this before the episode was released so if you really wanted to you could have gone back and you could have edited could have just gone back and just <laughs> and just said the word phlegm, phlegm. and edited it and it, yeah <laughs> you could have I'm just saying I'm just frankly, saying frankly frankly I think it's worse that you notified me like and and by the way. Folks, the way Matt notified me is I'm just sitting there the next morning, the morning after we recorded uh, working at my Uh day job, and I just get this message from Matt that's like, oh, by the way, um, you said phlegm last night, and it's pronounced phlegm. And like, I understand, (laughs) I understand your excuse, right? I understand. Uh But that's kind of, it's kind of like a man walking by a building on fire. Uh And when someone asks them why they didn't do anything, they reply, well, I thought maybe the building was supposed to be on fire. Yeah, right. Well, you don't know. I mean, you don't want to <laughs> interfere with the building burning down if, if that was the intent, right? Yeah, I think the the, the most important thing here is I it, this was a test for all of you because I put a note in the show notes of the episode that says, I acknowledge that I said the word wrong. Please don't message me about it. And uh, guess how many people didn't read that? <laughs> All um, of you. <laughs> all, of, all of the people who send messages. All right. Well, God, if you ever say something wrong again, I promise I'll say, hey, you fucking idiot. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You misspoke. Hey, the building's on fire. Yeah. You should, that's all you got to say. The building's on fire. Instead of coming coming back the next day and saying, hey, I think there was a building on fire down the road. Well, it's a good thing I never misspeak. <laughs> Uh, we're just kidding, of course, but, uh, I will be getting emails about this for the rest of my life because that's the way, uh, the internet works. Yep. Great. Uh, we had one final announcement for the week though, and this is a pretty big one, Matt. You want to, you want to tee this one up? Yeah. So, uh, some of you may remember those of you who've been with us for a while that we did, uh, a, a short fiction writing contest about a year ago, actually a little bit mm-hmm. over a year ago. And, uh, it's called the do the King thing short fiction writing contest and this is the do the king thing to short fiction writing contest that we are announcing today Uh, it'll be pretty much exactly the same format as last year's Uh, basically uh, we're going to be giving you four weeks to submit a uh, 2000 word short story 2000 words or less the idea here is to is for it to be a really short short story 2000 words is is not that bad really um, last week we got like about over 40 submissions. So, um, I kind of dread to see how many we get this time. <laughs> I um, hope it's more. I hope it's more. No, it, it was great. It was incredibly like heartwarming and a lot of people were, were really happy that and enjoyed the, uh, the chance to write. Um, the idea is to write something Stephen King esque. That's really the entirety of the, of the prompt. Yeah. Uh, we're not putting a lot of restrictions on you, just something Ke- Stephen King esque. A lot of people made it Dark Tower related. You don't have to do that. Um, that is kind of one obvious way to go, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, there is pri- there, there are first, second, and third prizes. Um, the, the grand prize is a uh, folio edition copy of, um, I believe it's Misery, right? Yeah. Yeah. There used to be two folio options on the folio website. I think when we ran the contest last year, it's just down to Misery. I think they stopped. They had a version of The Shining that I think they've stopped selling. Um, But also, they've said that they're going to do Dark Tower one day. So maybe in the next month, they will announce (laughs) and start selling a copy of The Gunslinger. So you could pick that one. But for now, yeah, it's just the uh, Misery. 
Yeah, so I've glossed over a couple details in here, but please just look at the announcement message on the doofmedia.com website. And yeah. if you're interested in, in submitting some some short fiction, um, we'd, we'd love to read it. Uh, I, I vow to read all the submissions that we receive. I will as well. Um, it was such a fun thing last week last year um we did a, a cool thing where we took the three winners and we read the stories out loud on a special bonus episode which was really fun we got to highlight and, and spotlight those incredible writers and man it was such a fun thing and i can't wait can't wait to do it again can't wait to see what y'all have in store for us yeah all right i think that's about it yeah we're gonna put a, a link to those details that are on our website in the show notes that you guys don't read so you can go to those <laughs> and can click on them uh to see all the details but uh we can't wait oh my gosh exciting do the king thing too it's here yep you know what else is here what chapter 10 Good. we're getting into it all right <laughs> Uh, we begin chapter 10, which is a Larry chapter with, with our good friend, Larry Underwood. When we last left him, he was kind of, you know, cowed a little bit. He's back with his mommy. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, he, he had all these debts from the West coast that he's run from and, and maybe he's, he's learned a little bit of humility from this experience and he's going to change his ways, right? That's kind of where we left him last time. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> We thought maybe, but um, I think the story is telling us, no, this is not the end of his troubles. Yep. he this, The chapter opens with him waking up after a night where he got completely wasted and hooked up with an oral hygienist. Uh, an oral hygienist. Ah, I see what you did there because the book did it too. Oh, yeah, yeah. It did, didn't it? <laughs> uh, I just want to talk about this a little bit before we get into the detail, though, because I, I, I think it's really key – the order of operations which was king handled larry here you know we we kind of mentioned this last week but when we met larry like on the west coast he was kind of this kind of airheaded moron who let himself get swept into things um and he wasn't like a, a particularly likable person but i don't think he was he really came off as like a bad guy either just kind of kind of someone that got swept up and stuff and when we first meet him he's this defeated child running home to his mommy so you kind of immediately have sympathy for him and then after fully establishing that we do this chapter which really like it to me is pinpointed at making you be like oh larry kind of sucks huh like I, like he doesn't come out of this chapter looking good at all either these next two chapters in fact and it gets you thinking, like, imagine what we would think of this guy as a person if this was our first introduction, if the opening lines of the Larry story in the stand were him waking up in the, the bed of this oral hygienist um, and then treating her the way he treats her here. I just think you wouldn't like him at all. And I think King doesn't want you to hate him, right? He wants you to understand him and he wants you to see the dark parts of him, but he, but he wants you to sympathize with him, too. And so that's that's what he opened up with. And then we get to lead into this stuff. Yeah, I think there's always a push and pull. You know, I, I agree with you that he started us out predisposed toward liking him. And then mm -hmm. he has kind of been reeling us more in the direction of showing us his flaws, um, almost pushing us to the point of, of thinking he's, you know, he kind of sucks, right? Yeah. I, I think that's intentional. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like, I want to say I like how much time King spends in in this part of the story, right? It was like I don't know what you call it other than the character introduction, because um you would think like last week's chapter was the character int introduction for Larry, but really we're still kind of in the character introduction section. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Um, he's, he's not rushing it. He's, he's sh taking the time to show the complexity of Larry and how he is kind of shitty. Um, I think King himself takes special pleasure in like establishing a kind of scuzzy person, scuzzy character who is nonetheless <laughs> three dimensional and ha you know, they have their inner strength and we're going to see that inner strength later. I'm sure like that's kind of been promised to us almost. Um, but, but right now we're kind of relishing how, uh, you know, all these bad decisions he's making and, and uh, what an idiot he's being. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. I think he really, he really, we, we've talked about this so many times, but he really enjoys exploring the darker side of people. Um, and the things that otherwise quote unquote good people will do. Um, and, and Larry does some mean shit in this chapter. He really does. Yeah. I mean, in contrast to some of the other bad shit we see happening in these chapters, it's, it's, it doesn't really rank, but like, it's, it's just kind of cruel, selfish, low 
base. Yeah, yeah. I think mean is a good word. Yeah. Mean and, and childish too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to talk about the use of the word gobble in the <laughs> opening parts of this chapter as as Larry is discussing the oral he gets from the hygienist. It's this perfect mix of like it, it kind of reads on the page as funny because it's just kind of a funny word generally, but it's also like kind of gross too when you really think about it, right? Like it's the, the, the way he's describing sex with this woman is um, crude and demeaning to her, I think, a little bit. Yeah, the, the word gobble gets used over and over again. And you're right, like, it's definitely not a word chosen for the connotations of being like, awesome and like erotic. You know, th there's a way to describe a sexual liaison uh, that would be compelling and kind of make you think like, oh, this guy's quite the uh, Lothario. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's a romantic conquest. But it's like, no, he, he doesn't feel good about it. The word choice guarantees that we aren't imagining that he's thrilled about it. And we kind of think that it's a little sordid and gross actually. Yeah, definitely. And, and and I think this is like the one thing I, I want to talk about a lot through this chapter is I think this lines up to exactly the way that Larry was described from his mother because what's happening here is Larry has done a stupid thing. He's got himself drunk, he hooked up with someone he really didn't care about um and he's got himself in a bind. And he's feeling guilty about that. Like he wakes up. The, the, one of the first things he feels in the morning after waking up is not uh, anything towards this woman, but thinking about his mom and how he got out and got wasted and didn't call his mom to let him, her know that he wasn't going to be coming in that night. And so he's kind of feeling really guilty about the way he's treated his mother again. And he's really taking it out on this woman. And that, that I think matches perfectly to what. Uh, what Alice described of Larry in, in last week's reading was like he gets himself in these binds and he hardens up to get out of them and he will just run over anyone that's in his way. Um, and that happens to be this woman. And that's what he's going to do here. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, I have some thoughts on on the speech that his mom gives him, but I'll save those for later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Larry retraces his steps, which allow him to be filled in on what we see happened since we last saw him and and i love i love uh, we the, one of the things we see is in the morning larry finds a note that his mom sent him um and here's what the note says or, or here's larry thinking about the note just thinking of the note was enough to make him wince no dear before his name no love before her signature she didn't believe in phony stuff the real stuff was in the refrigerator Sometime while he had been sleeping off his drive across America, she had gone out and stocked up on every goddamn thing in the world he liked. Her memory was so perfect it was frightening. A daisy canned ham, two pounds of real brother. How the hell could she afford that on her salary? Two six packs of Coke, deli sausages, a roast beef already marinating in Alice's secret sauce, the contents of which she refused to divulge even to her son, and a gallon of Baskin Robbins peach delight ice cream in the freezer, along with a Sara Lee cheesecake, the kind with strawberries on top. So like lots to talk about in this paragraph alone. I think the thing I wanted to say first and foremost is the line, how could she afford that on her salary is really fascinating to me because like I know butter can be expensive, but also it's, it's butter. I really think this comes from a place of Larry still viewing his mother as the same person she was when he left. Like, we will learn in a bit that Alice Underwood is not just a cleaning lady, as he said she is. She's actually like the floor supervisor. Like she manages the entire floor. That's her job. And so like it seems like she's doing pretty good for herself, right? She's not like rolling in it, but it seems like she's doing pretty well. And so like he can't see past this image of her he has in his mind. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think maybe that that could go both ways a, a bit. He kind of reverts into a child in front of her and he kind of sees her as the same person that she was. Mm -hmm. But, but talking about this note, I think it's really interesting that the thing he highlights first and foremost is there's no deer in here, no love in here. Um, and yeah, I find that really interesting, Matt, because obviously she loves him. Like there's this big long paragraph of all the things she went out of her way to get for him. Right. And, right. and every person has different ways of expressing their love. And I feel like, Larry acknowledges that she loves him, but part of him, maybe this is just me, but the subtext of the stuff is, I wish she had put dear and love in the note. Yeah. Like, that's actually what I want. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it was really interesting how that paragraph kind of unpacked itself in my brain when I first read it, because it starts out saying, 
the contents of the letter made him wince. And so you're primed to, okay, why? I'm looking mm-hmm. for that. Why did the contents make him wince? The next sentence says, his mom doesn't say dear or love. And so you think, oh, he's wincing because his mom doesn't express any love for him. Right, and he feels right. bad about that. But then like it kind of almost turns around to mean the opposite because you realize like, well, maybe his mom's wincing. Or he's wincing because his mom has gone to such pains um, to to get all of his favorite stuff, which sh- shows how much she cares. And he's returned the favor by not calling her and being a shitty son. Yeah. And so he's wincing because he has let her down. And I think I think after kind of reflecting on it, I think maybe it's both things, you mm-hmm. know, he he's he wishes that she would be a little bit more, um, you know, sappy, but also he feels like he's a shitty son at the same time. And that's really kind of the problem. Yeah, well, I mean, I totally. But I, to, to get back to order of operations, right, it, this is, you know, why <laughs> why is Larry's first thought when he thinks about this note? Oh, she doesn't put dear in the, in the title she doesn't put love mom in the signature why is that the first thing he thinks about because because that's the first thing he thinks about right that that seems significant and I, and I think you're totally right the reason he's wincing is not because he's mad that she didn't do these things but because he feels bad that she clearly loves him here is her expressing her love um and he treats her like shit and she yeah. goes above and beyond i mean like jesus he just right. showed up like she goes to the store and buys every single thing he likes and goes out and do- and does it while he's sleeping you know like yeah. this is this is one of the most pure expressions of love <laughs> in my mind ever that like you go out of your way to get stuff specifically just to make the the person you care about happy um yes that that's exactly the word the wording that I want to nail in, and, and I think, I think we have to we have to put a nail or a pin or whatever here because this is a thesis for the the whole week's reading, maybe the whole book. I, I mm-hmm. anticipate that this idea will go forward. This idea that like real love is the love that is shown, that is demonstrated through actions, and then separate from that, there's love that is for show. There's there is attestations of love, which uh, may not have a lot behind them. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to say it now so that we're kind of primed when we get there. Uh, the way that Jess behaves toward Franny, the way that her mom behaves in general toward Franny and the world is, is all about appearances, appearances of love, appearances of propriety. And and, and in contrast, we have here uh, Larry's mother doesn't really give a shit about appearances. She she literally just got that stuff for Larry so that Larry would have the stuff that makes him happy. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not about guilting him. It's not about showing anyone else. It's just to take care of her son who she loves. Why is it that we put such a premium on the part that requires no effort, right? Like we do. Like I think – like I said, I do think there's a part of Larry here – that if you forced him to admit it, that like said, I really wish I had a mom that told me she loved me all the time. So my thought on this is specifically in context of Larry and Larry, who, who Larry is, is like he he knows that she cares for him and would give him the shirt off her back. He, are, he, he knows that, but he wants her to be proud of him. He wants her to admire him. He wants her to think that she did a good job raising him. And if she thinks thought all those things and maybe she would be a little bit more gushy and she would you know pinch his cheek and and tell him you know you know good boy i love you you've taken such good care of me right but he knows Mm -hmm. it's not true and so that's not a general answer to the general question of why do we value saying i love you but in his specific case i feel like that's where it's coming from no i think you're i think you're spot on there i agree uh such a wonderful complicated little relationship these two have yeah isn't it yeah uh, so our dental hy- hygienist comes out of the kitchen after making them just like a full on breakfast. Once again, a- an act of service to show that she cares about someone, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, Larry is a complete asshole to her, uh, you know, just like fully in hit it and quit it mode at this point. Right. Um, I, the thing I find interesting here is, you know, but we're seeing two versions of Larry being mean to this woman. The, f- the first is the way he's talking to her, but also like his inner monologue as he's dealing with this situation is really mean to her too. Like he's dismissing her as like, Oh, this little Sandra D um, from, from the musical Greece. Like it's, he's just so 
mean right like like on all levels like like literally what we talked about he's he's gotten himself into a jam and he's hardened up now and so we see it externally but we also see it internally he just wants out of the situation he's going to do whatever it takes to get him out of the situation yeah right i mean just to emphasize it it's we're so we're kind of in his head so much that it it actually is worth it to pause and realize what a jerk he is being because mm-hmm. like hey she's like cooking you an elaborate delicious breakfast and you can't even like he doesn't even have the the decency to just like eat the breakfast and yeah. then leave and not call her, <laughs> which would at least <laughs> which would at least be like a, a way of appreciating and like sharing some kind of moment of of value and humanity. But it's it's like, no, he's literally going to like run, run away. Um, yeah. I mean, there's nothing inherently like bad about, you know, getting yourself into a physical situation in the heat of the moment that you maybe didn't want to. Um, and then the next morning being like, Oh, I'm really not interested. And like, there's nothing inherently totally disgusting about that, but like he's making, he's being about as bad about it as you could possibly be here. Yeah. Right. Like, it's fun. It, it, I think, yeah, this is the kind of situation like it's where I, I do think it's worth talking about. Cause as I was reading it, you, you are kind of in his head Mm-hmm. And so you see her reaction as being a little bit over the top. But then when you, this is what always happens on these shows is like, you go back and you, <laughs> and you, and you look at the situation objectively for the purpose of analysis. And you're like, I mean, maybe, maybe she shouldn't have thrown a, a spatula at him. Probably but, not. But yeah. I understand her being really hurt by his behavior. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and I guess we don't know fully like the kind of things Larry said to her the night before, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he was like really laying it on thick. Um, yeah. leading her on to a place where where she was expecting something this this next morning and uh and didn't get it but i mean like, again i i want to draw the contrast between you know people that care about you providing food for you because we the book has done this right like his mother we just we just highlighted the the strong qualities of his mother for for doing this this thing out of complete love for him and here this woman's making him breakfast um just just because she wants to and Instead, we're just going to be like, hey, screw you. And we're going to insult your accent. And 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 she she's racist in return, which is really strange. Um, but I don't know. It's like I'm not saying this is this is like a pure, perfect woman here. And, and Larry should have been nice to her. But like he's still a jerk here for sure. Yeah. The making fun of the accent thing struck me because it's like probably Larry has the same accent, right? Like, yeah. I mean, he might have a different bro accent. Like, I don't think he's. <laughs> But he probably has a little bit of a New York accent, yeah. As far as anyone outside of New York is concerned, they have the same accent. Sure, sure. <laughs> Which I mean, that's just it's it's a it's a interesting sort of insult, I guess, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it indicates a little bit of self loathing, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so as you said, she freaks out at him and throws a spatula at his head, which doesn't earn her any points. But uh, I, I want to talk about the writing here, though, because I, I really like this. She uttered a high squawk of anger and hurled the spatula at him on any other day of his life. It would have missed one of the first laws of physics was to wit a spatula will not fly a straight trajectory if hurled by an angry oral hygienist. Only this was the exception that proved the rule flip flop up and over smash right into Larry's forehead. It didn't hurt much. Then he saw true two drops of blood fall on the throw rug as he bent over to pick up the spatula. I, I love the playful nature of this writing so much. Like this is one of those things like I, I think this scene doesn't really make you love Larry, but I do think in King's head, this is kind of like a situation comedy type thing playing out here because there's a lot of playful humor and tone to the way the scene's being written. Yeah, I, I, I think the kind of rides a line between um comic farce and like sad and depressing and you're never quite sure where that line is crossed um i think you know it (laughs) probably exactly the moment when he starts watching the intricate traceries of her tears oh my god running down her body yeah um is where it went from like like because you're totally right it it is it is goofy and and funny and you're not you don't really you know you don't really care about her right she's she's not a she's not a real person to you you just kind of met her larry doesn't care about her through protagonist goggles we're just like (laughs) whatever but then like the crying and and the tear like running down her body and it's kind of like oh she's like a human and she's like really hurt by this yeah Um, and, and all and you're right i love that scene so much because 
all Larry can focus on is the tear running and landing on her nipple, right? Mm-hmm. And the, how like the the tear like magnifies her nipple to where he sees a, a hair poking out of it, and it's just like it's like, dude, she's fucking crying. You've heard yeah. like regardless of whether you want this relationship to continue you've made this person cry and should be a little more focused on that and all he can think about is the tear running down her nipple this is one of those things that like stephen king like first of all stephen king loves boobies like let's be honest like the dude (laughs) loves boobs he loves talking about boobs he loves writing about boobs but this is one of those situations where you know someone someone could read this and say ew gross stephen but I read this and say, ew, gross, Larry. Like the intent of this is we're supposed to feel gross about him like being weirdly fascinated with this tear running down a boob until it gets caught on on her nipple. It It's so disturbing. Yeah. And I think it's the kind of moment where, I mean, this woman's going to be dead in like 48 hours tops, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but like, statistically, yes, <laughs> statistically. Uh, and this is going to be a moment that maybe this sticks with him and this, this kind of the way that he was unnecessarily cruel to her and now she's dead. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and like the, this, this moment of, of staring with, with a kind of detached fascination at the, you know, the physicality of her sadness that he has caused for really no reason uh, I think is it could potentially be the kind of thing that haunts him. Like yeah. I could I could imagine a later scene where he thinks back about this exact moment. Yeah, I think you're right, especially the way we leave the scene in this chapter, which is, you know, Larry ducking out of the apartment, her, you know, in a very s- typical rom-com way, screaming at him from the, the window of her apartment, throwing stuff down at him. Um, the one thing she screams is, you ain't no nice guy. And this is a statement that will reverberate through him throughout the rest of these chapters, right? This is a line that repeats in his head over and over again. You ain't no nice guy. And he, every time he hears it, he insists on countering, yeah, no, I am. I am. You don't know me. I am a nice guy. Uh, And the book kind of leads you to believe that he doesn't really even buy it himself, that he, he at least on some level, knows that uh, I'm I'm, I'm not that nice of a guy. Uh Uh-huh. Well, this is another, you know, thing I think that's going to be a consistent idea is we have, you know, like we just mentioned, we have the the contrast um, between appearances and uh, uh, demonstration. And then here we have the contrast between being a, a nice guy and being a strong guy or something along those yeah. those lines, because he's not nice. Right. We We know that like we've pretty solidly established he's not nice, but maybe nice is not what we need from Larry or what the world needs from Larry. Maybe we need somebody who's a little bit of a hard ass who has a little bit of steel in his spine. Um, because I think maybe one of the ideas in this book is going to be that sometimes nice is incompatible with what needs to be done. Yeah, maybe. I I mean, and just general broad questions of like, what does it mean to be nice? What does it mean Mm -hmm. to be good? Um, what does it mean to be bad? What like what what are these terms and what do they mean? Um, I think I think you're you're spot on there. I mean, this book was written before the term "nice guy" was actually like a pejorative in yeah, the yeah. in in the you know modern parlance. Yeah, um, definitely. So clearly, there are there are there are uh, strengths and weaknesses to being nice. <laughs> definitely. Um, All right. So we move on to chapter 11, which is another Larry chapter, which is an important milestone in this book. Right, Matt? This is our first chapter that sticks with the point of view from the last chapter. Every other one so far has jumped point of views between chapters. This is the first one that doesn't. And it's, it's done so, I think, to kind of clearly draw a line between Larry's interaction with Sandra D and Larry's interaction with his mother. So we can compare and contrast them, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. So hailing a cab, Larry heads over to his mom's work uh, to apologize to her for going out the previous night and not calling to let her know. That's that's why he's going there, which is, again, you know, kind of a weird thing to do. Right. Like I, I just like going to someone's place of work to be like, hey, my bad. I didn't call you last night. OK, good. <laughs> good talk. <laughs> uh huh. I guess I'm going to go back to work. Yeah, right. yeah, right. Like it definitely could have waited. And because he wants the absolution, right? He wants 
expect her to say, oh, it's okay, you're good, especially after the encounter with this woman. He wants uh, his mommy to tell him that he's not bad. Um, and, and I think that's what he's going here for. And, uh, and spoilers, he doesn't get it. Uh-huh. It, it's up for debate whether he's going there for absolution or whether he's going there to get his, to, you know, to, to get chewed out. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, because he th- maybe he feels like he deserves that. Yeah. No, I think I think you have a point there for sure. Uh, before we get to that, though, we got to deal with this paragraph. She hooked a small stool over with her foot, climbed up on it, and began to count the bottles of floor wax on the top shelf, touching each one lightly with the tips of her right thumb and forefinger as she went. She had to reach, and when she did, her dress pulled up, and he could see beyond the brown tops of her stockings to the waffled white flesh of her upper thighs, and he turned his eyes away, suddenly and aimlessly recalling what had happened to Noah's third son when he looked at his father as the old man lay drunk and naked on his pallet. Poor guy had ended up being a hewer of wood and a fetcher of water after all ever after him and all his descendants. And that's why we have race riots today, son. Praise God. (laughs) Um, so in our normal way, we have to kind of explain and explore biblical references as Stephen puts them in his books because they are frequent and, and they are not always so clear. This is actually an interesting one, Matt, because in, in my time in, uh, the Catholic church, we, we learned a lot about Noah, but, Basically, everything we learned about Noah stopped after the flood was over. We didn't really spend a lot of time learning about Noah and his sons and what happened next. I Um, agree. So this was a story that I actually had not heard before I I dove into it for for this podcast. Yeah, no, I 100% had the same experience as you where the Noah's Ark story was taught like totally in isolation. I almost... It was much later that I even realized that Noah had like a, more of a role in, in other events. Yeah, yeah. So for those that don't know the story like we didn't, the basic story is here. After the flood, Noah becomes a farmer. One of the things he plants is some grapes. He figures out how to make wine from those grapes. He's the first guy to figure out how to do that. And he gets really fucking wasted. Um, a, a fun side note, but in my research, I learned that like biblical scholars like try really hard to – make this not Noah's fault that he got fucking trashed and is a total lush because they were like, well, nobody had ever had wine before. So how was he supposed to know that's Mm -hmm. what it did, which is just hilarious. Like he got fucking trashed and passed out naked in his tent. Come on. Like Uh we've all, we've all been there folks. We've We've all been there. Yeah. We've all been there. It's not that bad. (laughs) Um, So in the story, Noah's son, Ham, finds him, sees him naked, tells his two brothers about it. His two brothers grab a blanket and cover up their father. Noah then wakes up, is super pissed off at Ham for some reason, and curses his son Canaan uh, to be a servant to his brothers for the rest of his life, and and so on and so on and so on. That is the biblical story. Matt, uh, that's it. That's uh, so interesting. So, you know, it's interesting because I figured, okay, well, bringing up Noah in a story about a apocalyptic cleansing plague where almost everyone dies and a few survivors are left sort of the obvious reason to bring up Noah is, is for that specific reference, the idea of, of the flood, you know, analogizing the flood and uh, the plague. Um, yeah. Now maybe there's other reasons too, but that was the first that jumped to mind. No, I think you're, I think you're spot on there. I think that is part of what, what, what King is channeling here. Um, but we don't really know what to do with that part quite yet because in this part in our story, we're not in that post flood world. Um, so we, we can maybe keep that in mind as we go to th- the further breaches of this book, but I don't really know what to do with that, that yet. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing about this Bible verse, Matt, is that it doesn't actually make any fucking sense. <laughs> uh-huh. Because like if the Bible is supposed to be a series of, of stories and and you know uh more morality tales to kind of teach people the correct way to behave this story does a really bad job of it because the book never tells us like what ham did wrong here like it just says he saw his father drunk and naked and he told his brothers about it and therefore his children's children's children were cursed for all eternity um was it the act of seeing his father naked that was the bad thing was it telling his brothers about it was it not being the one that covered him up 
there's no, no idea. It's not in the story. Now, scholars have said that perhaps one of the original interpretations of this, when the book says he went and told his two brothers that actually Ham was just like walking down the streets going, hey, my dad's drunk and naked. Uh-huh. <laughs> Isn't that funny and sad? Um, if that's the case, then that makes sense. But that's not actually in the story. That's not what it says here. So the the moral here is, I don't know. Don't see your parents junk, I guess, or uh, else you're damned forever. Right. Or if you're gonna, then pretend you didn't. Um, it's also funny to me that it's Noah that curses Ham. It's not It's not God that curses Ham. Mm-hmm, uh, like mm-hmm. I specifically checked the reference and it's like Noah curses, well, not Ham, sorry. He curses Canaan, Ham's yeah. son, which is even yes. more weird and like yeah. twisted. But it's Noah that actually like, so apparently in the Bible, sometimes they're just dudes who have the magical power to just levy a horrible <laughs> curse uh, onto their own grandchild for untold generations. Yeah. And it's also like one of those things where like, what do we mean by curse? Right. Because in this instance, it's literally just your sons have to be the servants to your brothers. Right. That's, that's not necessarily a curse so much as it is just like an order from the, the patriarch of the, the home. I guess but of course true. it, but of course that's the thing though, because these things get passed down in stories and stories and stories and, and it becomes a curse. Right. And that's yeah. the thing. If you've heard of the curse of ham, you've heard of it in the context of Southern slave owners deciding that this story in particular is the Bible saying slavery is good and should happen because actually Matt, the, the Canaanites were the original uh, black people and the Bible here is saying that they should be, that they are inferior and should be servants to others, which is, I mean, like, look, there's a lot of fucked up shit in this book. That's definitely not in the story. Like that's just literally something they pulled whole cloth in order to morally justify this terrible thing that they were doing. It's just ridiculous. And that's, that's by the way, what Larry is talking about when he says, and that's why we have race riots today, right? The idea that, yeah. that, 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 all black skinned people on the planet are descendants of Ham's children who were cursed for doing this thing that were not exactly clear what he did, which is just, it's just absurd. Like yeah. it's just, there's no, there's no support for that anywhere. Yeah. Right. I think definitely worth pointing out here because it, it is in fact, Larry himself who, who makes that remark. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I mean, this, this kind of continues this, this interesting race thing that's kind of been circling Larry these past couple of weeks, right? We've had this, this very specific thing last week where people were saying that, you know, when he's singing, he sounds like a black person. That's what, what all the white people in his life are telling him. Um, and then we have, you know, this thing again, circling this, I, I don't, I don't know exactly where to put this yet, but it is interesting, right? Yeah, it is interesting. Um, another thing that I was thinking about is that we don't, I, I, as far as I can remember, I don't think we have any black characters in the story yet. Um, I don't think so yet. No, not that I've been specifically called out. It's yeah. hard for me to remember because I've watched both miniseries and and characters uh-huh. have been changed. Like in the in the miniseries that came out in 2020, Larry is black. Um, uh-huh. So that's a, a change that they did. So uh, it, my gut my gut keeps having to remind myself that in this version he is he is textually white in this book. It's very actually matters quite a, a deal to his character in this book because they've they've drawn attention to it several times. But yeah, and and I mean Stephen King very often has black characters in his stories. It's mm-hmm. normal. I, I would like I would say most of the story. I don't know, I don't know about this for a fact, but I would I would guess most of the stories we've read in in this project have had have had central black characters. And the fact that there are none here, I almost want to say that in and of itself means something. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll see. Yeah, we will. We will. So Larry tries to apologize to his mother, but when his mom doesn't, you know, immediately give him what he wants in in the conversation, he he flips out a little. And and finally, Alice Underwood lets him have it. She knows he's in trouble. She knows he's only here because he had nowhere else to go. And she will help him because she loves him. And she says this. I never said a mean word about you to anyone else, Larry, not even to my own sister. But since you've pushed me to it, I'll tell you exactly what I think of you. I think you're a taker. You've always been one. It's like God left some part of you out when he built you inside of me. You're not bad. That's not what I mean. <laughs> that's uh, that's rough to hear from your mom, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a gut punch. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Larry does know on some level she's right, I think. But 
but she tells him he can stay like his response to being told he's a taker is basically like, fine, I'll leave. I'll move out. I'll go. You won't have to deal with me anymore. And I think that's a dumb thing to say because she doesn't want him to do that. Right. Like she yeah. obviously wants him to stay. She just bought a fucking fridge full of all his favorite foods. That's not what she means by this. She's not saying stop taking from me. She's just saying you need to admit this about yourself. Right. Right. She's saying you, you asked, <laughs> I'm just telling yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's just um, at a meta level, like as, as a storytelling technique, I think, you know, this is a, this is pretty direct to basically say we're going to have this character tell this other character, hey, Larry, this is your problem, you know, <laughs> as a character. Yeah, this is this is your central uh, crux. This is your struggle. Um, this is what we're going to be dealing with uh, regarding this specific character is is he seems to be a taker and he does he doesn't like this about himself he's a taker he's he's not a nice guy um can that be okay you know can he can he can he resolve that can he accept that where, where are we going to go with him but it's been it's been pointed out very specifically um yeah yeah and um I, I, I love it. We, we talk about how Stephen King is not subtle at times, right? And I don't think we need to layer, you know, the who he is behind, you know, subtext and subtlety, right? Like yeah. having a character, especially a character's mother, come right out and say it works, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, we're, we're big fans of Stephen King's directness in storytelling often yeah. where, where he'll yeah. just be like, this is the way that it is and mm -hmm. we're going to move on. I love I'm it, man. be coy. Yeah, there, there's plenty of places to put subtext in your books. I think who your characters are as people is not one of them. Are you, that's the one yeah. thing you want to be the most clear. And I also don't think this is such an you know, unrealistic thing to happen. Like I... I personal anecdote is like I had a friend when I was a teenager who sort of did exactly the thing that Larry did here where he's like he's like come on like really tell me like like well, why is it that I'm having this this problem in my life and I was like you really want to hear it really <laughs> sure and then and I kind of I kind of gave it to him in, in the in the way that uh that Larry's mom does here and uh, my friend then proceeded to turn his life around. Um, wow, look so, at you. So, you know, I sometimes I wonder if I shouldn't lay in to people more often, just kind of. I mean, sometimes harsh honesty is definitely what people need, for sure. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like a very real moment and, and it kind of, it's kind of awesome. I, I like it a lot. I, I really liked what you said about he knows he's a taker, but he doesn't want to be. I, I think you're so right there. Mm -hmm. I think Larry's problem, though is that he can't get out of his own way sometimes. Like there, there is this moment where they, they settle up and everything's good again. And, and we get this line right here. For the first time that day, he felt good, really good. A small voice inside whispered he was taking again. Same old Larry, riding for free, but he refused to listen. This was his mother after all, and she had asked him. It was true that she had said some pretty hard things on the way to asking, but asking was asking, true or false, right? And so this is like a clear delineation to me that like he hasn't learned anything, that unlike your friend, this is not the moment where he's going to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to turn my life around, right? Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think um, that is, that's what's interesting about this beginning part of the story for Larry is um, it's not like he's had a moment of of cathartic realization and he's turning his life around. Uh, he's had several uh, uh, wake up calls mm -hmm. and none of them have woken him up. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, maybe it'll take the end of the world to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we obviously are going to know that that uh, Alice Underwood is going to get Captain Trips and 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 die. Um, although I, I think she hasn't officially died at the end of this week's reading, but so far everyone who catches this yeah. thing dies, right? So it's Seems not a spoiler like to say that. So right, yeah. So yeah, I mean, there is this real real feeling here that had you know this super flu not existed, this relationship could have just continued on where he would happily keep taking she would happily keep giving and nothing would have improved. Um, but, yeah. but that's not quite the case. Right. Right. And we get this really great ending of the chapter where Larry is, is going to the movies to see uh nightmare on Elm street five, I guess he, j they just say it's one with a Roman numeral after it. And I think, uh, Freddie five came out in 89. So uh -huh. I'm assuming it's that one. But I don't know. I, I was really curious if this scene happened 
in the original version of the book? And if so, what movie it was? Because the original Nightmare on Elm Street didn't come out till the mid 80s. So it was definitely not it was definitely not a Freddy Krueger movie when King originally wrote this book. That's funny. Yeah, I, I would like to see what uh, version, uh, what, what what film uh, it was in the previous version. That would be funny. Yeah, there is someone um, in our subreddit kind of doing a detailed, you know, week by week comparison for us of all the big changes between the original version and the uh, uncut version. Um, so if you're at all curious about that, head on over to reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia. And there's, I think, a new post for this week's and it, they're, it's really cool. It's interesting. I, I'm not going to the detail of doing that, um, but it's really co- interesting to read for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, this chapter we're about to get into with Franny Goldsmith and the parlor uh, was not in the cut version of The Stand that came out in 1978. I just which, find that shocking. Yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. This is this is very kind of, I don't know, very strong stuff, mm-hmm. very Stephen King stuff. Um, a lot of it kind of reminds me of Salem's Lot in ways that I have a hard time putting my finger on exactly, but um, but but in a very good way. Yeah. Um. Uh. You know. I don't. I don't know if we mentioned this, or I don't know if I mentioned this to you actually, but like there, there was like a preface. You know, preface to this edition. Yeah. Where King kind of talks about his reasoning for writing this this new version or for releasing this new version, and one of those, I think maybe the only specific thing that he references as a change is like. It, it you know it, it broke my heart to have to cut out um uh franny's confrontation with her mother and i didn't know what the hell that meant when i read that in the, in, <laughs> in the preface but it didn't you know, i didn't care uh and, and now it's like oh here it is yeah and i and i get i get what he means exactly yeah i it's i i think i should say that i've never read the original version the version of this book i've read has always been this 1990 version so like this is such a core moment for franny's character to me that I just can't imagine the story without it in it. Like, I just can't. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get into it. Chapter 12, Franny. We catch up with Franny Goldsmith in her mother's parlor. And like we said, I I earnestly believe this is some of the best King writing, like, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. It's so good. It's You're absolutely right. It's the best thing that he does. It's the best version of the best thing that he does. Um, it, it's so great. We kind of start out with uh, Franny talking about the the place she feels the most safe and the most at home in her house, which is her father's workshop, which is like the symbol of all the happiness of her childhood. You know, days out there with her dad, helping him with stuff, just being with him as he worked uh, in his workshop, the smells, the dirt and grime. And these are all things that she 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 thinks of us as happy memories good memories good parts of childhood but the parlor now the parlor if the workshop was the goodness of childhood symbolized by the phantom smell of her father's pipe pipe he sometimes puffed smoke gently into her ear when she had an earache after always after extracting a promise that she wouldn't tell carla who would have had a fit Then the parlor was everything in childhood you wished you could forget. Speak when spoken to. Eat. Easier to break it than to fix it. Go right upstairs this minute and change your clothes. Don't you know that isn't suitable? Don't you ever think? Franny, don't pick at your clothes. People will think you have fleas. What must your Uncle Andrew and Aunt Carlene think? You'll embarrass me half to death. So this is the parlor. And Matt, I'm curious if you ever had a parlor in in your houses. And it doesn't have to be a literal parlor, but just the the room that kind of room (laughs) that kind of atmosphere oh man probably i lived in a bunch of houses uh to be honest Mm -hmm. um you know i'm going to take your question at at an angle and just say like um uh my grandparents house was was like the home base because we my grandparents never moved even though my family moved like every year Mm -hmm. and so i have a lot of memories associated with my grandparents house over the period of my entire life um, and, um, I actually just got a, a lot of their furniture, um, because they, they passed away about a year ago and then I just got a big shipment of their furniture and it's like really, uh, I don't know, really powerful and, and kind of surprising how just having their stuff in my house is kind of bringing memories along with it in, in a way that I guess I should have expected. Um, um, mm-hmm. but anyway, that's, that's not what you were asking at all. The, the point is that, that I, I think there are places and, and rooms and settings where I have kind of bad memories associated with and uh, yeah. not not a not a parlor, but definitely a, you know, the, the scene of some terrible childhood embarrassment that kind of still makes me cringe, even though it really shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about 
you know, the childhood a lot on this show because Stephen King writes about childhood a lot. And I think one of the great things about childhood is, you know, the sense of freedom and exploration and like the ability to get to get dirty and just like and and rough and and tumbling through life, you know, that kind of stuff where you feel invincible, unbreakable. But there's the other part of childhood, which is the part where you you have no control over your life to where you are completely subservient to to these uh, these people. They tell you what to do, when to do it. They constantly insult you uh, at times or maybe to your eyes um, and ears. And the parlor represents that portion of Franny's life, right? The, the portion of, of where she was ordered around, told to do things she didn't want to do completely without power. And it just so happened it all happened in this particular room, which is a perfect combination of images because – uh, I, I think I think parlors missed our parents' generation because I agree with you. My <laughs> my grandparents had a parlor. Um, I, I don't know if it was technically a parlor. It was a room in the house where everything was breakable and we were not allowed to go. We were not allowed to go in this particular room. I didn't understand why there was this whole big space in my grandparents' house that nobody ever went in, that nobody ever relaxed in. There's like couches and they have the plastic on the furniture and there's all these like display cases with china and things in it and like I, I, I like we weren't allowed to go in there. And so it was this this closed off room of like neatness and tidiness that like kids were not allowed in and so taking this and and attaching it to the miserable parts of childhood the, the lack of control of childhood um i think it's just a perfect image and it just you can see it like i can close my eyes and i'm just putting franny into my grandparents parlor and it's it's great it's really great that's really interesting so yeah they i don't think my grandparents had a parlor in the sense that you're describing and just to um reference what we were talking about a minute ago the the parlor itself is a perfect metaphor for the idea of of uh, appearances mm -hmm. um it's a whole room of your house that's sort of designed to pretend that you are something a little bit different from what you actually are yep and she obviously puts a huge amount of her you know ego and self into this this room and all this great stuff and and the the, the history of it and the um, you know, the beauty and perfection of it is it's, it represents her and, um, this giant grandfather clock, right? Like, yeah, this, yeah that, that is like taking the center of the room out almost. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's interesting. I, maybe I'm just, I'm just saying this because I just literally am currently having this experience in my life of getting a bunch of heirlooms, um, that are now in my house, but like, I suddenly have strong feelings about stuff that's in my house for the first time. <laughs> like I, I used to joke, you know, like I hope my house burns down so I don't have to like have this stuff anymore because I just hate stuff. <laughs> um, but like, like now suddenly it's like, well, no, like I have that old, you know, uh, chest of drawers that was my, my grandfather's and it's like, it's like 70 years old and it's like, it's like important to me. And, and, and you can, you can imagine it, you can imagine if you had kind of grown up that way that you would have a huge amount of sentimental connection to like a bunch of your stuff and that that would actually be really important to you. Like I can, I can yeah. suddenly, despite not having been able to empathize with this prior to literally this week, um, I can suddenly empathize with it quite a bit actually. Yeah. I mean, I think that the adult version of me can see exactly why my grandmother did not want me playing in that room because I definitely would have broken some uh -huh. very valuable, very expensive stuff that was very important to her. But yeah. I think this is the disconnect between adulthood and childhood that like it does not make sense to a child why there's a room in your house that you can't go in. Why do we have this room if you can't go in it? I don't understand. And you're absolutely right because it is the room of appearance. It is the room meant to show guests to your house what kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. Um, and you don't have to go in that room. You don't have to. It, it's not supposed to be a functional room. It's supposed to be a show room. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And that's exactly what it is to Carla, who is, it seems, a kind of a show person. Um, yeah. the, the most important things to her, as we can see through the, the, the paragraph here, is how you are appearing to the people around you. Look at, don't you, like, don't pick at your clothes. People will think you have fleas. Why should you not pick at, pick at your clothes? Because of what other people will think. Because you will embarrass me. What will your uncle and aunt think? You yeah. embarrass me to other people. That is what Carla is most concerned with. And that is perfect for a parlor. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it is in this particular parlor that Franny tells her mother about the pregnancy. And uh, as expected, it does not go well, where Peter didn't really have blame for anyone in the situation. Carla seems to have blame everywhere. Uh, I, I like this one refrain that she uses again and again throughout this this sequence. She says the phrase bad girl, right? She says, you ate at our table. Cry Carla cried at her suddenly. We loved you and supported you. And this is what we get for it. Bad girl, bad girl. Um, I, I think this repeated use of this line is really great here. One, obviously, because she's talking to Franny like I talk to my dog when she eats a toy that she's not supposed to. Um, and two, because once again, I think this book is making a comparison between Larry and his mother and Franny and, and her parents. Like like the constant refrain in the Larry chapter was nice guy, right? Over and over again, we, we have this nice guy thing. And here the constant refrain is bad girl, right? And And I think neither of those are necessarily true. That is a really great parallel as well. Yeah. I, I mean, the more, the more I think about it, the more parallels I think there are between Larry and Franny. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're not particularly similar characters on the surface level, mm -mm. but when you dig a little bit, you know, they're both people with very strong wills. They're both kind of mucking up their own lives with the decisions that they've made. Yeah. And then they've had to run home to their parents and, you know, that's, in, in both cases and, and you know, the way that looks looks very different to both of them right they have sure. very different home situations um but there is a strong parallel in terms of what the plot is actually doing yeah yeah um and 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 like i said it, it's kind of true that neither of these assessments are, are really 100 percent accurate right because obviously larry is not a nice guy but he's not a altogether bad guy either and it's certainly true that that franny might have some negative qualities, but it's certainly not a bad girl either, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then Matt, something happens that we didn't expect. Peter does what he said he would not do. He gets in the middle of this thing and he stands up for his daughter. Uh, and Carla <laughs> does not react well to that. I, I actually love the writing here, though. Peter, I want you to leave this to me. I know you do. I have in the past. But not this time, Carla. This is not your province. Calmly, he replied, it is. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it so much. Yeah. Um, but uh, but this does not go well. And Carla kind of starts getting physical with Peter and trying to push him out of the parlor. This is not his space. This is not where he belongs. And she pushes him out of it. And as a result, he uh, he slaps her across the face and explains how things are going to be. And I, I find this such a fascinating choice. Matt, because on the one hand, like I was like, fuck yeah, for Peter during his whole speech where he's kind of putting her in her place and, and saying like, look, this is this is what you've been doing. We got to stop this. We need to help her. We need to love her. This is the way it's going to be. I was like, fuck yeah. On the other, I was immediately made viscerally uncomfortable by his act of violence here. And, and I'm wondering, like, is King wanting us to feel that way, right? Is he wanting us to be torn between these two poles when it comes to this whole thing? Yeah, I, I agree with your, your feeling of conflict that, uh, you know, you, you think maybe overall this is going to be a moment of fuck yeah. This is going to be um, he, he's going to confront Carla. Uh, Carla is going to to say, like, you know, she's going to, you know, maybe break down and weep and then. And then everybody's going to hug and then she's going to say, I'm sorry, I, I, I was unfair to you, Franny. And Franny's going to say, I love you, mom. And they're all going to hug and, and cry together. And it's like, no, <laughs> uh -uh. Uh, it's not a fuck yeah moment. What happens is Carla just immediately turns it into a fuck you actually mm -hmm. um, and ruins what you wanted to be a moment of triumph and what could have been a moment of reconciliation. Uh, obviously, it's too early in the book for triumph and reconciliation. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh and obviously, Stephen King would never <laughs> give us something that that, <laughs> that nice and and, and happy. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it's. I, I think I think that's the intention behind it. Is like he's setting up a moment that could have been good, and then it and then it turns bad. Yeah, I guess. What did you think of the slap itself, though? I mean, like, mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't know. Like, on the one hand. I just it just makes me uncomfortable. Like whenever you bring like a, 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 a and this is, you know, I guess technically gender normative of me, but like a man slapping a woman, a husband slapping his wife, I just immediately get viscerally uncomfortable with that. 
and I don't like I don't want to celebrate that guy at all at that moment because I'm like, hey, that's fucked up. Don't yeah. don't do that. Don't strike your partner. Well, sure. No. So, I mean, I'm I'm I don't think I'm jumping ahead in saying this, but like one of the first things I thought of when when that happened was like, and that's the last interaction he ever had with his wife was mm-hmm. slapping her in the face. And now yeah. he's going to, you know, if he lives, then he's going to have to live with that. If he doesn't live, then the last moments of his life are going to be thinking about how that was the last interaction he had with his wife. So overall, it's just like, you know, fuck, like, like, I know I'm not reflecting on the part of the act that, that you were kind of asking about, which is like, how are we supposed to feel about it? Like, I think we're supposed to feel like it was a mistake, that it was a, it was a bad thing to do. He shouldn't have done it. He knows he shouldn't have done it. It was out of character for him. Actually, it was, it was a moment of, of duress where he kind of was pushed and, and he reacted badly. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think he would defend it, you know, either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree with that for sure. Um, so as you said, Carla does not say fuck yeah. She says fuck you. And she storms out of the room, heading up to her room, locking the door. Conversation over. Nothing resolved. Hooray. Um, she also says in this moment that she feels nauseated. And I'm curious where your head was with that particular statement. Because we will see later that she does indeed come down with the super flu. That's kind of where we leave Franny this week with her mom in the hospital. And I couldn't remember the first time I read this if that pinged off me as a gesture towards the flu uh, or if that's just general like I feel nauseated because this whole conversation disgusted me so much it made me feel sick. And I'm, I'm, I, did you read ominousness from that statement or did it just come at you as straight as it, as it, as it I think probably was supposed to? No, I was too in the moment um, for, for, to even think about it as being a, a flu symptom that mm-hmm. didn't occur to me at all. Yeah. Do you think King was trying to play it as that? Oh, yeah, probably. I, I do because he has been uh, dropping breadcrumbs, uh, little hints throughout almost every chapter. Um, and it would it would actually be unusual <clears throat> at this point in the story for there to be a chapter that didn't have one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think that's probably, you know, the clue in this chapter. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you're right on that. I I think we're just... This is probably one that I think was the most, I guess, hidden. Hidden is not the right word, but I'll use it. Yeah, I, I think it's um, ambiguous, though. So, you know, I could see it either way. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we move on to chapter 13. We're back with Stu now, who has finally be giving, been giving some answers by a man named Dick Dietz. Well, k- kind of. It's mostly classified. He does learn a little bit of stuff here, Matt. He learns that almost all of his friends from his hometown are already dead. So so that's nice. And he learns that he has no trace of the virus in here. Um, so so hooray. <laughs> we yeah. learned some stuff. Yeah, right. There is a bit more uh, information conveyed here, right? Yeah. I I particularly liked this line, though. Listen to me. I'm not responsible for you being in here. Neither is Denninger or the nurses who come in and take your blood pressure. If there was a responsible party, it was Campion. But you can't lay it all on him either. He ran. But under the circumstances, you or I might have run, too. It was a technical slip up that allowed him to run. The situation exists. We are trying to cope with it, all of us. But that doesn't make us responsible. Then who is? Nobody, Deet said and smiled. On this one, the responsibility spreads in so many directions that it's invisible. It was an accident. It could have happened in any number of ways. <laughs> so, like, I get that, like, that's practically true. And, like, the, at this point in the whole thing, like, assigning blame is unimportant because it doesn't matter that this is the situation and we have to deal with it. But why don't we blame the people that made the super virus in the first place? <laughs> You know, like, yeah. why don't we like if we're looking for who to blame about this whole situation, uh, the people that decided to create a deadly flu virus. That would seem to make sense, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, Scott, I don't want to get too mired in the politics know. of the moment. Matt supports Project Blue. <clears throat> it is hard to talk about this book without talking about COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is um, very Because, you know, you know I, and I just I think. I couldn't escape the, the the implications for what he's saying to, to our situation because, you know, uh, it's not like one person made the decision to start doing gain of function research. You know, maybe at some point, some one person did think of it as a concept, but it was clearly a whole kind of institutional, uh, you know, consensus that, that gain of function research was a thing that we were going to do. 
And the thing that, that what, what led to our disaster in the real world was a culmination of, of many small bad decisions, which didn't even maybe seem bad at the time. Maybe, maybe they seemed good at the time. Uh, and, and then those bad decisions were enabled by small acts of silent acquiescence and people not speaking up when maybe they could have said like, Hey, are we really sure about going this direction? And, and so, yeah, we, we got to the point where this thing that he's talking about basically happened. It wasn't as deadly as it could have been, but it did basically happen. And it's basically the way he described it, where you can't really nail the responsibility down to a single person. Um, and it's another way in which this book is really prescient. And um, and I, I don't know what to do with that. Like, it's weird because I like to, I normally like to like finish my thoughts and be like, and that's, and that's the way it is. But like this time I'm just like, and um, yeah, I guess we're all kind of responsible maybe. Is that mm -hmm. kind of what King is going for here? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think so. I think like, I, I love that line on this one. The responsibility spreads in so many directions that it's indivisible. I, I love that line that like when, when we are all to blame, blame ceases to be a useful tool, you know, like, yeah. and so that's, that's kind of Dietz's point here. I think that like, we live in a society and this is this is society's fault right uh, um yeah. this is this is the world we've this is an end result of a world that we've created that this is you know you create a world in which these things exist and these opportunities for accidents and failures to exist and this is the end result it could have happened in any number of other ways you know um he's speaking specifically to the accident that brought this flu out but you could expand that beyond the flu right the end of humanity it could have happened in any number of other ways right yeah um that i think that is absolutely true yeah. could have been nuclear could have been mm -hmm. yeah. yeah uh Stu's response to this whole thing though is to get really mad and pretend he's got a bad cough <laughs> um to share scare the shit out of this guy uh which makes Stu like ob objectively the greatest person in the entire in the entire world right yeah Stu getting like like fucking with him and, and somehow getting an edge in the conversation despite the fact that he's really not holding any cards is pretty yeah. awesome yeah why did you do that it's classified <laughs> <laughs> i love Stu. yeah um and and then we get to the end of this this chapter which is our rather short short chapter here and it ends on something that we need to talk about briefly here it ends on a dream. Um, Stu is standing in a road in between stalks of corn. There is someone off in the distance picking a guitar, and Stu has this strong feeling that this is where I ought to get to. Yes, this is the place, all right. Um, but there's something else in the dream. There's a darkness, a badness. We see red eyes coming from out in the corn. So obviously the whole time this has just been a stealth uh, Children of the Corn sequel, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the real reason I bring this up is because it's it's kind of weird, right? And 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 we will see later in this week's reading that there's a Nick chapter in which Nick has basically an an identical dream, standing in the middle of a road surrounded by corn, a feeling that this is a place he needs to get to, but also feeling that there's a dark presence there. Um, the double beat of the same dream basically declares this as a supernatural occurrence, right? And this is the first that has happened in a book like this so far this book has been pretty much straightforward mundane existence you know yes there's a, a super virus but we're told that that was created in a lab by the government and um so there's really no supernatural stuff happening in this book and now suddenly there's these weird dreams um and and we don't really know what to do with this yet but it's here the book has kind of started to shift towards this in an interesting way and i just want to get your thoughts of it here at the very beginning yeah, I mean, I figure there's somebody with the shining out there in the world somewhere calling to the, him and to the both of them. Um, who this person is, I I don't know. You know w w what they want, I don't exactly know. I, I think this may be one place in the story where I may have absorbed some knowledge of of the book from from the culture, um, but I really don't know more than what I've outlined here. Okay, cool. So we leave Stu behind and then head into chapter 14, which is a very short chapter with uh, with Dietz. Um, and he is basically speaking into a tape recorder, uh, kind of recapping all the information he has. And the basic gist of this chapter is that they're 
they're super fucked, Matt. They're all fucked. Um, everything's bad. I love how he kind of lays out the information here. We've got a disease that's several that's got several well-defined stages, but some people may skip a stage. Some people may backtrack a stage. Some people may do both. Some people may stay on one stage for a relatively long time, and others zoom through all four as if they were on a rocket sled. One of our two clean subjects is no longer clean. The other is a 30-year-old redneck who seems as healthy as I am. Denninger has done about 30 million tests on him and has succeeded in isolating only four abnormalities. Redman appears to have a great many moles on his body. He has a slightly hypertensive condition, too slight to medicate right now. He develops a mild tick under his left eye when he's under stress, and Denninger says he dreams a great deal more than average. Almost all night, every night. They got that from the standard EEG series they ran before he went on strike. And that's it. I can't make anything out of it. Neither can Dr. Jen Denninger, and neither can the people who check Dr. Demento's work. <laughs> so that's a, a lot of information we're just tossed there. It, it's a very, you know, this is one of those chapters. I think this is another one of those chapters that was cut in the original version. Mm -hmm. Um and I, this is one of the ones that I kind of get it. Like, I, it's not that I dislike it. It's just like, this is an info dump chapter, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's funny because I, I think I think the received wisdom nowadays is is uh, uh, info dump is bad. Uh, telling rather than showing is bad. And it's like, I think I think bad telling is bad. <laughs> but <laughs> fun, well-written telling is fun. And also when you're kind of hungry for a little bit of an info dump, it's kind of nice to just have an info dump. And yeah we're kind of information starved at this point. So um, I didn't yeah. mind this at all. And I think it's framed rather well with this character who's just kind of at, at his wits end. Um, mm -hmm. There's also some fun character work here where we see that like what Stu did with the, the threatening of the cough actually did have an effect on this guy mm -hmm. that he like says specifically here, I got a taste of my own medicine. I got a taste of what it feels like to be left out on something. And I did not like it. Yeah. Um, and so you can kind of see that, that Stu is kind of winning him over slowly. Um, it's it's great work I, I love it um we get another slight beat here about dreams which again we don't know what to do with but the, the text seems to be starting to emphasize dreams rather specifically yeah my um totally out of my ass guess is that the moles actually might have something to do with why he has the immunity the dreams are just because somebody's talking to him with the shining the moles it's, it's eh? it's the moles for sure super moles it's the super moles <laughs> all right from here we move to chapter 15 which is a very short chapter i think it's only a page long uh we are with a nurse named patty greer and uh she's working at the disease control facility matt and she sneezes she sneezes before she goes on her rounds but she fails to report her cold symptoms to anyone and the virus begins to spread in this environment as well which is really just like the death knell of the human race right like if people trained in disease control management cannot contain or report this thing who who can yeah right right i mean it, it's if if i pretend for a second that i don't already know that the virus is going to be totally uncontained and kill almost everybody um then i can take this as a moment that's kind of nudging you in the direction of understanding what is coming which is mm -hmm. like no this is not going to be one of those novels where they successfully contain the virus outbreak this is not the hot zone or outbreak um popular in the mid 90s actually um, both of those uh stories about successful containment successful treatment um scientific triumph over over nature uh, no 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 uh no heroic doctors racing to face a cure just normal people doing their jobs ineptly and it's not enough and the world is gonna suffer yeah and there's something to me so human about this woman's you know reaction like mm -hmm. she is in a facility with a super virus with a big, huge sign in front of the nurse's station that says report any symptoms of cold immediately. And she does what anyone does when they cough or sneeze or are feeling something. She just ignores it because that's kind of what we do. And I yeah. mean, that's that's exactly how these things spread. That's exactly how COVID spread as much as it did. Like you feel sick and you brush it off and say, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not, this can't be that. No, it's yeah. just, just a little tickle in my throat. Just a little, a little bit of, you know, um, little stuffy nose. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It would be inconvenient if I was sick. Right. So, yeah. And as a parent, I can say it is very inconvenient when you're sick. It really fucks everything up when you or your kid are sick. So I, I understand on a greater level than I ever had before the idea of just, 
let's just take him to take care. He'll be fine. <laughs> I don't, for the record, I don't do that. But like, I understand why, right? Because yeah. like, if the option is, well, now I've got to take a day off work and be home with my kid. Um, it's, it's like, it's a, it's a much more complicated calculus. Like it just fucks with your whole life. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I get it. It's, it's incredibly human and it's why these things spread the way they do because yep. we're imperfect, stupid creatures who ignore signs of badness because we don't like them. I think this is like the great thing about Stephen King is, is he's really, you could say he's being cynical or whatever, but it's like, no, he's just being accurate, accurately depicting the way human beings are. We're kind of, kind of selfish and, and inattentive and, yeah. um, very just it's just accurate yeah, yeah. The, i i asked the question on twitter last week i didn't want to make this a discussion question because it just seemed a little too dark but like i asked people if they were rereading this book or had reread this read this book since covid you know what would the experience was like for them and the common refrain we got from people is like man this guy just nailed people's reactions to pandemics like he just he nailed it he like i don't know how much research king did into this beforehand or what but he just got and gets people. Yeah, exactly. All right. So from here, we move to chapter 16, uh, a very interesting chapter so far, Matt. Thus far in a book, our, our chapters have primarily been basically one of two things, right? A chapter furthering the story of one of our four main characters, or at least four as of now main characters, or a short shiny chapter about a one-off character that the book is kind of clearly signaling as being less important than the rest because they're probably going to die. And then we have chapter 16 and we have the character of Lloyd. And I don't think we're quite ready to say this is absolutely an antagonist quite yet, but he's the closest thing we've seen so far to one, right? Um, yeah, fair <laughs> to say. Uh, I'm trying, I'm, I'm doing that thing where I'm trying to like hedge while also being like, this guy's a piece of shit. Uh -huh. <laughs> he's, he's a bad guy. He's a it's, bad guy, Matt. It's hard. Is a bad guy. Hard for me to imagine him making a, a good a turn for good. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we meet Lloyd when he is traveling around America with his good old pal Poke and his trusty pokerizer, uh, robbing and, and murdering and just generally being bad people. Uh, I think the interesting thing about this is is not our our Lloyd and Poke monsters, which of course they are, but Lloyd just comes off as. Um, an idiot yeah <laughs> i agree like, he's really dumb he's, he's he's very dumb um i don't know if you've read in cold blood or maybe you've watched the film capote about mm -hmm. truman capote but like both yes yeah like the, the i think me as well I, I think this section reminds me of the murders committed by hickok and, and smith uh in you know the true story um and, you know, the overwhelming impression that I recall from the book was that the killers or at least one of them was just almost too dumb to understand what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, maybe not to the extent that Lloyd is here, but it, it reminded me of like you get this pair of guys kind of doing a bit of a rampage and doing things that are kind of almost like worse than they can really comprehend. Um, yeah. And and that and that's what we're dealing with here. Yeah. I mean, I think we get like I'm not saying Poke is like the smart one of the two, mm. but he definitely seems to be more aware than Lloyd is like poke is the one doing most of the killing. It seems. Yeah. Um, well, he, P poke is also the one making the decisions. Yeah. I think, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I, I love this particular writing though. On top of everything else, they were interstate fugitives had been since they crossed the Nevada border interstate fugitives. Lloyd Henry would like the sound of that gangbusters. Take that. You dirty rat. Have a lead sandwich. You lousy copper. You know, <laughs> You and our friend Michael wrote a uh, a story a few years ago, and in that story was a character who was a guy who was had convinced himself he was a 1940s bank robber uh -huh. and just talked like that constantly, even though he was kind of a dumb idiot. Uh -huh. And I think I think I said to y'all at the time that this reminds me of someone from a book, and I couldn't tell you what that book was at the time, but this is what I was thinking of. Uh -huh. um, and he's not exactly like that character, but he is like he's obsessed with this this cool image of him being like the the outlaw running away from the cops and he has no idea what he's getting himself into yeah it's like it's like pretend for him he doesn't none of it seems to feel uh yeah as weighty as it should for him i think that's something worth talking about here matt this this chapter to me has this kind of air of disconnectedness to me 
it just reads kind of not not dreamy, but kind of loose in a way the other chapters haven't. Because I think like Lloyd is just kind of like just going like he's just going along mm-hmm. with everything. Like he he really doesn't have a large amount of buy in to everything that's happening. He's just kind of flowing with it. And and so the chapter takes on this this feeling of like floating or just like riding the breeze a lot it's really interesting yeah. i'm not sure exactly how king accomplishes that yeah there's there's the detachment and and also i, I do think that lloyd literally makes zero decisions he yeah. just does whatever poke tells him mm-hmm. um and and i think that, that all adds to what you're talking about yeah so we learned that lloyd and poke met each other in a minimum security joint and met up after they both got out for a big score uh the billion, the brilliant big score they had, Matt, was to rip off the Italian mob, uh, take all their money, guns, and drugs, and then take off. Uh, they do so. They also kill the guy who helped set up the score for them, just because they just decided to in the moment, or at least Poke did. Um, it's it's one of those like you know, like we talked about with the the um, spatula and the scene with Larry. This is some stuff that is like kind of funny. In, in in some uh-huh. ways, because it's so ridiculous, but yeah. ob- obviously also awful, right? Well, the funny part to me is how fucked they are. Um, like like it, you're you're watching them you're watching them do these like like this dumb and dumber routine, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Th- like like thinking that they're being brilliant masterminds as they do things that are guaranteed to put them in the electric chair, uh, which of course is they don't even make it to the electric chair, or at least uh, Poke doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, you can just imagine like, I, I I'm just imagining like, uh, 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 damn, I forgot his name. The, the, the mobster from the dark tower, like getting a hold of these guys for stealing his guns or whatever. Like, like, it's just a really, it's a really bad choice. Um, um, yeah. I mean, let alone the cops chasing after them, yeah, they would let, have let the entire the, Italian mob on their ass. The, yeah. The, the, I mean, yeah, that, that's what I was thinking about was, was like they're, they're interstate fugitives. And also, even if they can escape from the cops, they have literally the mob after them. Like it's just mm-hmm. hilariously, a, a hilariously bad situation. Yeah. But like the writing, man, you know something old buddy poke said, pausing. Nope. Lloyd said, giggling nervously. Not a thing. <laughs> I wonder if old George there can keep a secret for Lloyd. This was brand new consideration. He stared thoughtfully at gorgeous George for a long, hard minute. George's eyes bugged back at him in sudden terror. It's just so funny, yeah. right? I, I love it. I love I love the looseness of it. I love the funniness of it. And it's also very dark and disturbing at, at the same time. Yeah, it's yeah. this is a bad dude. And you can kind of see how a bad dude can do terrible things while barely being aware he's doing them. Yeah, I think the key thing about him is he just has no real human empathy. So the mm-hmm. idea that they're going to kill this guy to keep him quiet, even though it's like there's absolutely no reason why this guy would talk yeah um it's uh it would be it it would be his ass too if he talked yeah like he'd be fucked so yeah Yeah, right um like uh, yeah he says that right here it's his ass too lloyd lloyd see maybe lloyd is smarter than he gives himself credit for he's just a follower you know yeah i think he's just just gotten so used to following yeah exactly so lloyd and poke go rob a gas station to get some additional cash and poke decides to just randomly pokerize a random woman in the store a man in the gas station pulls a gun and blows his head off lloyd responds by opening fire shooting the cowboy who shot his friend he tries to make his escape but uh, little does he know that there's been a tri-state manhunt after their asses for the last week or so um so as he exits the store the state trooper stops arrests him and it's party over for lloyd and uh, and we leave him knowing that the next time he wakes up, he will be in the infirmary in the prison he's in now. So uh, that's the end of the chapter, Matt. What did what did you make of this chapter? Because it's really interesting, right? We have this character who doesn't really match with any of the other four characters we've had. Obviously a bad guy. The tone of the text is different. Um, where are we where are we going with this? What do, what do you think about this? Um, I mean, for one thing, I'm pretty sure that Lloyd's going to be one of our few survivors. Um, it, this is sort of a, a what's the word? A, a, a you know hilarious irony that this one guy who we you know wish would die because uh, mm-hmm. he sucks is going to be one of the few people who lives. Which is like um, I don't know. I, I don't know what exactly we're talking. We're, we're we're implying about like justice and the metaphysics of all this, but sure. interesting anyway. Uh, assuming I'm right. Uh, another, another interesting thing about the the whole chapter and the framing of it overall is just I thought it was really interesting to pair Lloyd up with Poke because Poke is clearly the worst of the two. Like he's yeah. more 
floridly violent and psychopathic and he, he just shoots people for no reason. He's the one whose idea it is um, to kill the other guy. And, and you do get the sense that Lloyd is swept up in all this and he can be, be, be persuaded easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, like we said at the beginning, I don't expect Lloyd to get a redemption arc. I think he's, he's a murderer. He's an unrepentant antisocial murderer, but like maybe we could buy that this was all just his upbringing and, and the people he associates with. And, and, and maybe he could be a better person if he were around better people. We could go that direction. I don't think we're going to, but we could. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't I I mean I do know I was about to say I don't know I do I do know <laughs> but yeah I mean you, we kind of leave it's really interesting because we've had this relatively short chapter introducing this character we don't really know fully what to make of him yet we don't really get much of Lloyd's backstory right we know all we know about him is that he was in prison for attempted rape um, and then he got out and immediately went and did this with his friend Polk. So that's really all we know about him. We don't know much about his past. We don't know what led him to that moment um, and and where he's going to go from here. But yeah, we've got this 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 bad guy who who, as you said, possibly could be one of our few survivors, which would be delicious irony. And what does that mean for what the world looks like when most of the people are gone? Uh, right. We don't know yet, but yeah. definitely pauses to consider what that means with, with yep. the that the 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 end of the world will have people like Lloyd in it exactly all right so we move on to chapter 17 we are back with good old general starkey who is uh he's dealing with some troubling information matt you see a, a doctor in sipe springs texas has made i believe that's sipe right i don't know i, I don't think that's a real town yeah, I think he's, he's, he's probably making Sipe. up town names. As, Sipe Springs, Texas, has made a good guesses and, and put things together about the uh, the the flu outbreak that's happening there. And worse, he's been talking to the press about it. Matt, oh no, oh, oh no. no. Um, I guess if you can't stop the spread of a virus, you can stop the spread of information about the spread of a virus. Sure can. <laughs> I want to read basically what Starkey is doing is he's thinking back um, about what a, a, a general told him years ago when there was another thing they had to cover up. Gentlemen, a regrettable incident has occurred. And when a regrettable incident occurs, which involves a branch of the United States military, we don't question the roots of that incident, but rather how the branches may best be pruned. The service is mother and father to us, and if you find your mother raped or your father beaten and robbed, before you call the police or begin an investigation, you cover their nakedness, because you love them. Starkey had never heard anyone talk so well before or since. Um, which, uh, I don't know, that's kind of back to Noah and the covering of uh, and your, your naked father, right? That, I think that's, I think in my mind, that's an intentional connection back to Larry and that story. Yeah, wow. I, I didn't make that connection, honestly. But now that you pointed it out, I don't, I absolutely think it is, and because it, it works on the thematic level too. Like it's, it's emphasizing how kind of insane and fucked up that is. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it, 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 in, in the metaphor, like, I guess I might cover my parents' nakedness out of like reflex, but clearly, justice is like the more important consideration. <laughs> yeah, more important than than the niceties of of hiding nudity. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, I, if someone beat and and abused my parents i would be much more concerned with just making sure they're covered i i the the priority there is to find the people that did that right and, and bring them to justice yeah right the the so, so the overall point here i think once again is about appearances yep which ties yep. back to franny's mom like so franny and starkey are both extremely concerned with keeping up appearances and and keeping up appearances has indeed led everyone to their deaths um yeah you know, and, and then in contrast, we see characters like Larry's mom who doesn't care all that much about appearances, but but rather just doing what's right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's, you know, once again, sketching out that that conflict appearances versus versus reality. I think you're so right there. And and I'll try to extend this to Lloyd as well. He, he's a, he's a man who wanted to play the part of the uh, the bank robber of the the murderer of the outlaw right like he wants that to be this this appearance that he has uh we we don't see like there's no reason for that other than he wants to be perceived that way um and that seems to be a recurring beat yeah i i that um i guess i don't know i don't feel like i know him well enough to say but but sure i think that i could that could work yeah so Starkey orders something called Troy, which we basically learn is the 
uh, execute order 66 of the United States military. Um, uh-huh. They are going to prune the situation. We, we cut from here over to a photographer and a reporter driving to Houston to file a story about the disease outbreak in Sipe Springs. Uh, they're rocking out to baby. Can you dig your man on the radio, by the way? So just we're connecting everything together. Um, they're suddenly stopped by two young men in a Ford who open fire and kill them both. Um, I think it's really interesting that we have this sequence. And and this is, again, I think something that was cut from our original uh, version of the story. Um, I, I think King looks at this and he says, it's not enough to show the men making the decision to kill innocent people who might leak our own screw up. We need to actually see it. We need to see the horror of it. Because the thing about the sequence is it doesn't it doesn't shy away from the horror of this happening. We see these two men die brutally hardly right like this is this is a tough scene to read this is not this doesn't have any of the kind of loose uh comedy of of the lloyd murders um it doesn't have any of the, like the joking sitcom nature of the larry stuff this is just two men who did nothing wrong being murdered by their own government um and it's horrible it's horrifying yeah. well it's yeah it's an interesting in contrast with the lloyd murders because it's like what the mil- what these military guys are doing is strictly speaking literally a billion times worse than what Lloyd has done. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And yet we kind of, it's very easy for us to condemn Lloyd. Oh, he's a murderer. It's like, well, yeah, these people are also murderers. These people are, are mega murderers. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I think so, you know, depicting it as this kind of horrible, unglorious, unawesome um, depiction of violence is, is appropriate here. And, you know, it, it's really fascinating how King can, in one scene depict gun violence in this kind of almost slapstick fashion. And then in the next moment he depicts gun violence in this like nauseating, uncool, scary fashion. Yeah. Um, um, yet another, another interesting thing to point out, I guess is just like, you know, I, I almost said we're seeing the government try to contain the outbreak. And then I realized like, no, the government's not trying to contain the outbreak. They're trying to contain the information about the outbreak. Mm-hmm. The outbreak's already out. They're just covering their nakedness, right? Yeah. Which is like, it's like, okay, the, the cow has already escaped from. And yeah. yeah. And it's ultimately pointless, right? I mean, in, in uh, the upcoming Larry chapter, we'll see that people in California are already talking about this thing. They've yeah. already named it. Um, there's no stopping the information from getting out. These two people that, you know, statistically were probably going to die anyway, um, have just died horribly for n- nothing. For no reason, yeah. just to buy the government a few days of plausible deniability that will do nothing for them. Because, as you said, like at this point, like Starkey is very kind of candid that the writing's on the wall. Um, yeah. That that there's nothing they could do to stop this thing. They can only try to control what people know of it. Um, there's really we we didn't pull it, but there's a really interesting scene in here where he gives the order. And he kind of like expects his subordinate to push back on him for it. Like uh-huh. he's kind of defensive when he gives the order and his subordinate is just like, no, don't you understand? You did the right thing. And like these are like it's very easy to see how these systems created a super flu in the first place. Right. right. That these are the people that that are are ultimately so absurdly convinced that they are on the right side of this thing, even even as they're ordering the deaths of innocent people. Yeah. Um, it's it's wild i I just think it's particular i don't know maybe i'm just thinking too much about i think it was the movie outbreak where it's like the plot is like the government's gonna bomb the city and kill everybody but the doctors have to rush to find a cure and that's not what's happening here they're killing people they're not trying to contain I, i don't know it's just like i'm repeating myself but it's just fascinating to me how it's 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 explicitly not like oh well they're committing violence but it's like for the greater good because like if you extinguish an infected population then you've contained the virus and then you've saved the world and so it's like a it's like a terrible trolley problem moral conundrum mm-hmm. but at least you could make a case that like they had to do it it's like no this isn't that at all they're literally just covering their ass in a psychopathic fashion um and i, I don't know i just felt like it was important to kind of nail down that distinction yeah no i think that's a good point for sure all right, let's move on to chapter 18, Matt. Uh, and we're back with with Nick Andros. We haven't seen him since the end of last week's reading. And and we've got to catch up with this guy. We've missed him. Yeah, I love this guy. 
Um, so since we last left Nick, we've learned that Sheriff Baker has, with his help, managed to round up almost all the men who are responsible for beating the hell out of him, except for their ringleader, the sheriff's brother-in-law. He's gotten all of them. Um, and we see here that Nick really likes Sheriff Baker. The respect Nick felt for him was not because Baker had given him this job swamping out the holding area to make up for his lost week's pay, but because he had gone after the men who had beaten and robbed Nick. He had done it as if Nick were a member of one of the oldest and most respected families in town instead of just a deaf mute drifter. There were plenty of sheriffs here on the border south, Nick knew, who would have seen him on a work farm or road gang for six months instead. So that's really interesting, right? And I think this ties beautifully into something you've been talking about all night, right? Is the idea of appearances, right? Mm -hmm. um, of of how of kindness and doing something for appearances. I think I think this is really important. The book says here he had done it as if Nick were a member of one of the oldest and most respected families in town, as if you must treat these the respected people better. Because they are the respected people, because that is what appearance dictates, that 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 the respected people are treated better. Right. Um, right exactly. But, but the sheriff doesn't behave that way. Yeah, no, that's 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 perfectly, perfectly right. That's that's exactly what I feel like we're doing here. You know, and, and you know, we've seen we've seen some characters in this story so far who will be cruel for no reason. And then we've seen some characters who will show generosity just because it's it's right, you know, and, and I think that's that's what we're seeing here is is, is the, the sheriff is doing what's right because it's right, not because it looks right. Um, and he could he could be cruel. He could easily get away with being cruel here. Yeah. Uh, and he doesn't. Yeah. I mean, he, it doesn't even have to be directly cruel. Like he doesn't have to throw Nick in a, a work farm. Right. He could just not help him. Right. He could yeah. like th th there's there's kind, there's cruel and then there's indifferent. And it would be the easiest thing in the world for a person to just say, sorry, bud, not my problem. Um, it's going to be your word versus them. It's never going to go to trial. Not my problem. Get out of here. I want you out of my town by sundown. Um, yeah. You could yeah, easily do that. Yeah. Just just move along. We're not going to yeah. press charges. Yeah. Right. 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 Uh, and and no. So, yeah, it's like it, it's, it, it requires action to be cruel sometimes. It requires action to be kind. It requires nothing to be indifferent. And and that is the easiest thing to do in the world. And he yeah. doesn't do that either. So great guy, Sheriff Baker. Um, <laughs> yeah. Too bad he won't be living much longer. Yeah. The uh, one, one just thought here was just like I, I could I could imagine uh, uh, Nick ending up in the sunlight home from uh, the talisman. No. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh, boy. Luckily, we burned that place to the ground. Yeah. So on a trip to the bakers for dinner, we see that our kindly sheriff's cold is getting worse. So Nick agrees to head back to the prison and be responsible for watching it and feeding the prisoners. And while there, Nick agrees to write it down his life story for the sheriff. And therefore, we get to read the story of, of Nick Andros. Yeah. Um, you know, before we dive into the story of Nick Andros, remember last week how we observed that we distinctly did not get the usual king style pov for nick it felt distant and detached uh, we didn't get all of that characterizational language that made us feel like we knew him really well and that we knew his his life story um and it's because nick is detached from himself from his past from his own story uh and it's because his past fucking sucks um and forcing him to face it by writing about it is really painful for him and it's probably the only time that he's gonna think about it uh and and yeah. thus you know that's we had to do it that way yeah you're so right i mean it's <laughs> we had to do it that way for multiple reasons right nick cannot tell his story to anyone without writing it down which forces nick to relive the experience which is something he actively avoids trying to do so it's one of those perfect perfectly constructed moments that works for why Nick has been so closed off until this point, but also for why we have to dive into this past in this specific kind of way. It's, it's really great. Yep. So we learn through Nick's writing that his dad died when his mother was pregnant with him. And then when he was a young boy, his mother got hit by a car. I think it's interesting to note here that both of these deaths are freak accidents right his father had a heart attack after his truck through a tire tie rod and his mother got hit by a motorcycle when the motorcyclist brakes just like randomly failed like there's nothing malicious in here nothing you can assign blame to here it's really just happenstance that 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 happened to nick yeah that's a good point no um 
no malice involved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like they could have very easily said the motorcycle was a drunk driver. Right. right. Or, um, or, you know, Nick's dad like freaked out and got angry and had a heart attack, you know, like the, no, but it's just events completely beyond their control um, right. that yeah. led to, that led to their deaths and led to this great upheaval for Nick. Yeah. So we see that Nick ends up in an orphanage where he learns to read and write. And I think, you know, speaking to what you were talking about earlier, this is when the story gets really interesting to me because the way King has set up this entire sequence is unique. Up until this point, we are learning Nick's past through basically epistolary storytelling, right? We are just reading what Nick is writing. So what has happened to Nick, what we are reading about what has happened to Nick in his past is influenced by the character deciding what to say and how to say it. But when we get to the orphanage and we get to the moment of him reading and writing, which is possibly, we see here, the most important moment of Nick's life, that epistolary s- style breaks off and we get the, I guess, the real story, as it were, right? We we, we break off from the note itself and we just go through a, a montage of, of what happened to Nick while he was in, in the orphanage. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this this... Uh, he has had to let down some walls, right? He's had mm-hmm. to let down some mm-hmm. inner walls. And, and then, then we can finally get to the part where it's like, Oh yeah, this is, this is more like a normal Stephen King character introduction. Yeah. But he had to warm up to it because yeah. the guy the is so internally. Of, yeah. The act of writing kind of opened that door exactly. for him. Um, yeah. So we learn here that, that Nick's life in the orphanage is not great. Um, I, I love the writing here. The orphanage was a place of roaring sl- silence where grim faced thin boys made fun of his silence. I love that idea of roaring silence. Isn't that just a wonderful turn of phrase? I read it that is. and I was like, Oh, I love that so much. Yeah, no, it's very, it's it, relatively few words are spent here, but it still gives us an incredibly powerful impression. Yeah. So we see that Nick retreats almost all the way into himself and stops trying to communicate with anyone, at least until a deaf mute man named Rudy comes in and slaps some sense into Nick. And I, like, I kind of want to start tracking the use of slaps across the face in this book specifically and in the King universe at large. Like, It, it seems like King enjoys literally slapping sense into people as a, a move that he does. Like, We've had, got two instances in this week's reading alone. Yeah, they've all been slaps of justice and righteousness, um, or, or and also a spatula of justice. Oh yeah, there you go, a spatula. Yeah, yeah. So Rudy demands that Nick writes, and he does. And I, I copied whenever there's a picture in the book, something that you wouldn't get to see in the the audiobook. I like to copy it over here for you. So we actually do get to see what Nick writes on the card. The four words he knows, which are Nicholas Andros, fuck you, <laughs> um, written kind of like a child would write here. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's great. I, I can, I, I always, I, I guess King uses this a lot, right? It's not that common in novels, but King uses the idea of, of a little, a little illustration to, to hammer something home. Um, quite, yeah. Quite to, often. to really, to really lean into the emotionality of it. It's not enough for us to see that he writes this down when we see it in this childhood scrawl. I think it kind of drives home for us that he's, he's a kid who's terrified, who can't communicate with the world and has lost all the people that loves him. And he's, he's horrified and angry. And yeah, I think it just, it really, it really nails the moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love this part too. He tapped the empty white space with the tip of the pencil and then tapped Nick. He did it again and again and again. And finally, Nick understood you are this blank page. Nick began to cry. I love that, right? Like, like th- this idea that you're a blank page. You can you can decide what is written there. I think I think that's something a lot of our characters could possibly be going through, right? Like, we're gonna be coming up on the end of the world here, and so who you are is going to be fundamentally changed because your role in the world you live in is about to fundamentally change. And so there's this grand opportunity for all of these characters to redefine who they are and and what will they choose in these moments, I think is really important. And so this is kind of, I think the book trying to set this up for us, Nick had a similar moment where he, he got to say who he was going to be. I love that. I love that. I think, I think that's really spot on. Yeah. So the epistolary section resumes and, and 
all Nick says about Rudy, we go on this long multi-page thing where he talks about how this man kind of opened up the world to him again. He had retreated out of it and this one man opened it up again. And all he writes in the epistolary section is, um, I, I met a man named Rudy who taught me how to read and write and I was very lucky to have him. Um, it just goes to show the difference between what what you write yeah, about your story and what your story actually is, right? Mm-hmm. I think I think it's really telling that the, the title of this story is Nick Andros, A History or something to that effect. It's like he's telling the history of himself, but it just goes to show you how history is written, <laughs> it like kind of downplays the parts maybe you aren't comfortable sharing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's great. I, I mean, also, I think that the understatement uh, in, in in what he writes down really emphasizes the depth of his feelings mm-hmm. because it's, you know, it's like his life has been so rough that the only way to accurately express his life story would be nonstop sobbing. Um, and so rather than some half measure, all, all he can really be be uh, uh, content with is, is severe understatement uh, in, in this form, right? Like it, it, he, he either, either fill a book with his gratitude toward um, toward Rudy or, or just uh, – you just have to do it this way. I, I don't know. It, it, it hit harder for me that, that that he did it this way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So eventually the orphanage gets shut down and Nick has nowhere to go. So he runs away. We do learn, Matt, that he spent the last six years taking high school correspondence classes because he was taught by Rudy that education is extremely important. Um, so that's that's his story. That's what leads him to this moment. What what did you think about Nick's story? Um, I mean, Nick is a great a great character, right? Like I I think we see through the people around Nick that the only appropriate natural reaction to Nick is to be awed at his toughness and his tenacity in the face of adversity, especially when we see that he doesn't really see himself this way. Like that's another kind of charming quality of his is he doesn't Mm -hmm, really, mm -hmm. doesn't really see himself as, as being as sort of uh, remarkable as others see him. Yeah. Um, Yeah. it's, it's, It's actually fairly important that we have like the sheriff and the sheriff's wife kind of, to contextualize Nick for us because, because Nick is, is, is not introspective. Right. Um, yeah, you're so right because they both read the story and are kind of like awed by him where he, yeah. uh, the way he writes it down is just so matter of factly. Yeah. He's like, and then, so I, you know, I learned to read and write, um, despite being deaf and mute. And then I, uh, just wandered around for six years. Oh, but I'm four credit shy of, being able to take my high school equivalency and I taught myself completely by myself while working odd jobs and, and living on the road. <laughs> just like, what? <laughs> right. They're really, you're absolutely right. They're really odd. And, and I think saddened by him in some ways, they, they, they're upset for him. And I think that leads to this moment where Baker comes back into work. His flu is down and he's all better, which we know means that uh, he's definitely not going to die. Right. Uh-huh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Sure. Yeah, so so being touched by Nick's story means that Baker and his wife kind of basically say, "You should stay here. You should set up a life here. Um, This is a place where you can, you know, set up roots. um, Maybe get those last few credit hours you need. Take your high school equivalency exam. Get your diploma, and perhaps build a life here and stop your kind of wandering. And this is one of like this is one of those moments where King is just turning the knife, right? Because like. I think Nick is happy about this. I think Nick's been looking for a place to belong and a place to find meaning in his life and people to find meaning with. And he, he's he got it here her, finally. And we know we fucking know that it's all going to go away. It, that, that, that the, the flu is coming. The Baker's already sick. He's definitely going to die. And all of this is going to, none of this is ever going to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. And that really emphasizes, I think that, that a lot of these chapters are kind of, being done in like match uh contrast against each Mm -hmm. other because we just saw so so we got two characters who are who are oriented around jails and you know county jails basically right we got Mm -hmm. we got uh lloyd who is about to be carted off to jail for doing horrible heinous shit uh and then he's probably gonna escape scot-free because everybody's gonna die of the flu and in the meantime we've got nick who is acting as you know um um impromptu warden for this jail Mm -hmm. uh serving justice and and righteousness and having finally found a place in the world and and getting kind of some of some of what's some of what he deserves and then that's all going to be taken away from him right so it's like the 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 injustice of all of this is really being amplified um with this parallel that's fantastic point i totally agree 
Yeah. Uh, so cool. Nick continues to take care of the prison and is visited by both the doctor and Sheriff Baker's wife, noting that the sheriff himself is getting worse again. I kind of love that King cho- chooses to do these things this way. Nick is pretty much like, hold up and trapped in the prison but we're getting to see these like little glimpses of what captain trips is doing to the town on the outside like it's clearly spreading we learn that tons of people are calling in sick so none of the state patrolmen can come pick up nick's prisoners so the prisoners are stuck there it's just like clearly outside of nick's immediate purview like things are getting very very bad but he really can't see it and so we're only getting glimpses of it i know i'm about to sound like a fucking idiot here but um it was really only in this moment in the story that I realized how much of a pain in the ass it would be to be deaf, um, especially <laughs> like before there were phones that had text messaging because yeah, like, yeah, you don't you don't even know the phone is ringing, and if you were to pick up the phone, it would be useless. Uh huh. Um, especially like, if you're deaf and mute. Like at least it, right. e- even if if you're deaf, maybe you could at least like tell the person on the other like pick up the phone, right. tell the person. I'm deaf. I can't hear you. Right. Come, come to the prison, but he can't even do that. Yeah. Right. It, it, it just, I don't know. I just, the, the, uh, plot implications of him not being able to use the phone were, um, I don't know. They, they were, I found them really effective here. Yeah. And uh, what Nick wants comes true though. Remember he says he's been reading all these sci-fi books and been waiting for the moment where video calls become a, a norm. Yeah. And we got FaceTime now, bud. We got FaceTime thank god captain trips didn't come because we got facetime <laughs> uh-huh so now it would be fine though because we have facetime mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh we also see that that very night nick dreams of the cornrows we've kind of already talked about this but i think this is definitely that moment where you're like oh we're doing something here yeah yeah i i think i think it's i think it's the shining pretty pretty clear <laughs> So the next morning, nobody comes in to check on Nick. Nobody comes in to check on the prisoners. Nobody comes in to check at all. And worse, one of Nick's prisoners seems to have gotten a pretty bad cold, and it's getting worse. So Nick finally goes out to check on the world. And I I love – God, I love this writing so much. It was the sort of day where people like to get their chores and errands done early so they can spend the afternoon as quietly as possible. But to Nick, Shoyo's main street looks strangely indolent this forenoon, more like a Sunday than a work day. Yeah. So it's dead. <laughs> it's it's dead. Yeah, I, I love everyone's the, sick and dying. Like the, the, the creeping tension and, and dread as yeah. he just kind of lets the day pass and he's like, huh, I wonder where everybody is. And mm-hmm. it's like you just know that like oh, everyone has gotten sick. Everyone is yeah. dying now. And we, we don't even like we're going to meet the doctor in a second. And it's like we didn't even need to. I mean, it, it was a good conversation, but like we didn't even really need it. Like we knew we knew already that that what it, what exactly had happened. Yeah, yeah. We didn't need it, but perhaps Nick did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So Nick sees Dr. Soames driving erratically down the road, and it's from him we get an update. Sheriff Baker is dead. His wife is sick with it now, too, and people are dying all over town. Also, we learn that all the exits out of town are strangely closed now. There's these people dressed in construction equipment but saluting each other uh, that are blocking all exits to the town. I, I love – there's something that here about the matter of fact way we learn about Baker's death. Like, I think we, we knew it was coming, right? We knew he was sick. We knew he was going to die, but like to just learn about it for it to happen kind of off screen, like he was a character, right? He was a character who we've learned to like, and like, was getting along with Nick. And like, we talked about how kind he was and like, you know, there, there's, you know, what a budding relationship between these two people, you know, where maybe a serial killer comes to town and then Nick helps, is deputized to help solve the case or something. Uh Um, And that's all taken away in just an instant. It's just like, oh yeah, he died off screen. Uh, You didn't get to say goodbye to him. You'll never see him again. Sorry, bud. He's just gone. Yeah. It hits harder. And I feel like that's the kind of thing that's going to happen a lot because um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we can't, we can't get a proper send off for every single character because a whole bunch of characters are about to start dying. Yep. Yep. So Dr. Soames comes to the right conclusion. Somebody made a mistake and now they're trying to cover it up. He tells Nick to try and leave town if he can, but Nick can't leave those prisoners behind. He knows he's responsible for them. So he heads back to the prison to do the only thing he can, which is watch them slowly die. And uh, and that's that's the end of our chapter. So things are definitely, definitely escalating. Yeah, for sure. All right. We move on to chapter 19. This is another Larry chapter. 
Um, so far, we've seen Captain Tripp's spread into the story for both Stu and Nick, but we haven't gotten to Larry quite yet. So we catch up with our favorite rock and roller as he's wandering Times Square, New York City. And this is one of those interesting moments, Matt, that we can touch on briefly about aging the book up to the 90s. Because in the late 70s and 80s, uh, Times Square was not the tourist mecca it is today. Um, it was a not great part of town. It was stuffed with prostitution and porno theaters and crime. And it was just not a place that you would like, I'm going to go to New York City and I'm going to go see Times Square. <laughs> right. I think we talked about this briefly um, in the Wastelands when Jake was getting towards to the the demon house to get over to uh, Midland, right? Or Midworld. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. Um, he went through Times Square and it was not. It was not good because at the time it was not good. This is one of those things where I'm not too up on my New York City history. I believe it is accurate that it was not until the mid 90s with Rudy Giuliani as mayor that there was like specific effort taken to drive all of this stuff out of Times Square and turn it into a a beacon of capitalism (laughs) that it is today. Um so I believe in, in 1990, when the story is set, you would probably still see a pretty rundown, not great to be in Times Square, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, I, I am uh, not the New York expert on this podcast, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that King made some effort to make it uh, feel uh, correct here. Yeah, I just wonder how much was changed uh, of the the wording from one version to the other because i think it's i think it's not there yet but i think by 1990 it's like on its way towards what it's going to become yeah Um, if anybody can let us know what if any updates were made um to to sort of make uh uh, the setting historically shift i feel Mm -hmm. like this is the kind of thing that might have gone under the radar though you know Mm -hmm. i don't know but but i mean more importantly to our characters though is what Larry thinks of Times Square. And he says here, still, it was much the same, and this made him sad. In a way, the only real difference made things seem worse. He felt like a tourist here now. But maybe even native New Yorkers felt like tourists in the square, dwarfed, wanting to look up and read the electronic headlines as they marched around and around up there. He couldn't tell. He had forgotten what it was like to be part of New York. He had no particular urge to relearn. I really love this because this is, to me, part of what we talked about last week with Larry, his lack of identity, right? He doesn't know who he is or where he belongs. So he's a New Yorker, and he comes to New York, and he comes to Times Square, and he's just like, this doesn't feel right. I don't feel right here. This is wrong. I don't – I'm not I, – I don't feel like this person. Yeah, I, I kind of want to parallel this to like him rejecting the oral hygienist is like – she is she, in all these different ways. She was sort of a, a caricature of a New Yorker, and he. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that was why he rejected her. And it's like, well, but this is where you're from, Larry. Mm-hmm. And, and I think he's sort of rejecting that too, as as like I'm I'm not from anywhere. Um, um and uh, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I like that. Yeah. So we also learned that Larry's mother has called in sick. She's fighting a nasty cold. And then suddenly, Matt, Captain Trips becomes real for our Larry story, right? Because now we know that the, the clock is ticking for Alice Underwood. And uh, it's not a clock that you can outrun. Yeah, right. It's we kind of I, I guess it's it's sad, but it was it, I think it's a very intentional, clear choice that King made to make it very clear up front that anybody who catches this virus is going to die, right? He, he didn't have to tell us that right he, but he literally did tell us like yeah. very very clearly and 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 literally uh, if you yeah. if you have symptoms you're going to die which allows us to exist in this moment of dramatic irony here and again with the franny story and with the sheriff baker story beforehand right where where none of these characters treat this as if it's a death sentence but we know it is and exactly. so you know there's 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 kind of a shock here to that we know that Alice Underwood is is most likely 99.4% odds going to die. But right now, her being sick means she's home and Larry's there. And so all it means for them in the moment is they're just annoying the shit out of each other. Yeah. Um. So Larry heads out into the city to wander around. And it's just it's really interesting. Like, it's a really good way to play up that dramatic irony, I think. Yeah, I agree. So we see Larry once again go to a record store in which he hears his song playing. We haven't actually talked much about Baby Can You Dig Your Man as a as an art 
piece of art, Matt, it, that exists in this story. And I think that's because we really haven't seen much of it outside of the the chorus. But we do get to hear a little bit of the bridge here. And I just wanted to get your read on it. So we see here that the bridge of the song says, I didn't come to ask you to stay all night or to find out if you've seen the light. I didn't come to make a fuss or pick a fight. I just want you to tell me if you think you can. Baby, can you dig your man? <laughs> so what, what do you make of that? Um, I, I don't, I don't know what I make of that. It's, it's, I mean, clearly it's, it's one of these like, you know, love song subgenre songs, mm-hmm. right? Um, the idea, it's got the, the, the idea of, of, have you seen the light? That's kind of a religious reference vaguely. Um, somebody seeking acceptance, which is, which does kind of reflect the way Larry actually is. He, he's seeking a place. He's seeking, he's seeking a person who will accept him for who he is who will love him for who he is. That's, I mean, dig is, is a euphemism for, you know, love care about. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of all I got for now. Yeah. But I didn't come to ask you to stay all night or to find out if you've seen the light. And that's not why I'm here. Uh-huh. I don't want to hang out with you all night. I don't want to see if you've seen the night. I didn't come to make a fuss or pick a fight. I just want you to tell me if you think you can, baby, can you dig your man? So I don't I don't want to hang out with you all night. I don't want to know if you've seen the light. I just want to smash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you could you could certainly view it as as a, a more about shallow. So that's interesting because because I didn't necessarily read it as as let's let's do it right now. To me, dig could also mean like like do you like me? like like a, a, a almost more innocent than um i don't know you're probably right but i'm just um you know art art within art can be interpreted in many ways yeah well i mean we'll certainly see if we can pull more meaning out of this as we go yeah yeah oh somebody and somebody made a comment by the way on on the youtube actually that that pocket savior that basically pocket is is a musical term uh, referring to like a specific sort of jamming within within the musical groove so it's it's just like a music reference so i was just, i just didn't get that at all i did not either i am not a music ep- expert so that's that's good to know yeah so homesick for california larry calls back looking for wayne who he learns is also sick um it looks like captain trips is spreading faster out west than it is to new york right um, yeah, it sounds like things are getting pretty bad out there. It actually kind of snuck up on us too, because mm-hmm. we, you know, I, this is kind of the first we're hearing that it's already like everywhere on both coasts. Yeah. Um, and and this is where we learn that that California itself is actually the origin of the phrase Captain Trips. That's what the um, Arlene on the phone says that they are calling it out there. And this is worth talking about, Matt, because we kind of touched on this briefly last week, but. No spoilers, but this book never really explains what the nickname means, where it comes from, um, other than just this line of they're calling it Captain Trips, right? This is basically it. Some random woman on the telephone says to Larry that they, they're calling the thing Captain Trips, and that's basically it, right? Um, now, we do have to say that Captain Trips was a nickname for the Grateful Dead's Jerry Garcia, um, and also a nickname for the red, white, and blue top hat that he war at times um but like what does that have to do with a super flu (laughs) i don't know i mean jerry garcia used to like spike people's drinks with lsd so maybe like tripping captain trips and this is kind of makes you feel like you're woozy and and tripping so i i don't know it's just so wild to me that like he you have this very distinct name for this thing this very memorable thing like a classic stephen king giving something a very memorable name and they just doesn't bother to ever explain where it actually comes from uh it's very stephen king to me right i mean it's funny because i remember learning the the name captain trips back in um um wizard and glass actually mm-hmm. and i've just figured like oh it's probably like the name of like the you know army captain who <laughs> released it from you know quarantine and it's like no it's not not that at all actually and and yeah i guess the the lsd spiking spiking with lsd is as good a guess as any i I don't know i i kind of want to stretch for something about how like the hat that he wears is like an america hat and so like the book is about like the fall of america some some 
America. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. Well, I, I don't know the Grateful Dead super well, but knowing the Grateful Dead, I think there was supposed to be a certain amount of irony in Jerry Garcia rocking like an Uncle Sam red, white, and blue top hat. So, uh-huh. so maybe there is something to the idea that that it is it is a distinct reference to America. Um, and I do find myself wondering, like, presumably the virus goes everywhere, right, in, in the whole world. But the book is is clearly focusing on America and Americans um, and, yeah. and their reaction to it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know. But uh, you're definitely right that we are primarily focused on the U.S. right now. Yeah. Uh, so Larry also learns from Arlene that he's got a savings account with 13 grand in it. Uh, so I guess his his ship has finally come in. His baby, can you dig your man? Ship has come in, and I kind of love this map because th- there is this moment here where the money comes in, and it seems like all of Larry's problems are going to be solved. Right? He tells Arlene he'll be back out in California in a week or so, and it's very possible that without this flu in it, Larry's life would have just continued to spiral from there. Right? There there would not have been a moment where he got into this jam and then suddenly he's going to get out of the jam. And uh, and everything will be good. Right. And you wouldn't no change required. Right. Just keep on rolling. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not going to happen. We know that. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like it, it, it's funny because in one sense, we're like, oh, thank, thank God he's you know, he's, he's bailed out. And then it's like, well, that's exactly the kind of bailout that will keep him in exactly the same cycle that right. he's been in for the whole book thus far. Exactly. Exactly. And his his take on it is like, fuck yeah, I'm bailed out. I don't have to deal with any of my problems because I'm good. I can call up my mom and tell her that don't worry, mom, I got money now. You don't got to worry about anything and it's, I, I won't have to change. Um, yep. And of course we know when he tries to call his mom, she doesn't answer. And so he rushes home, uh, try, knocks on the door. We hear her moaning. He, he, he kicks in the door and then we see that Alice Underwood is very, very sick. Um, it's it's thundering. It's raining. This is super dramatic. Um, and, and we get this. This is how we end our chapter. I'll be back, he muttered and went to the door. He was scared, terrified for her. But underneath, another voice was saying things like, these things always happen to me. And why did it have to happen after I got the good news? And most despicable of all, how bad is this going to screw up my plans? How many things am I going to have to change around? He hated that voice, wished it would die a quick, nasty death, but it just went on and on. Oh, uh, boy. Love this character. <laughs> I, I do, too, because, like, I mean, there's part of me that just wants to be like, well, who cares if that's a voice in your head as long as you don't act upon the things right. that voice in your head is saying? Like, that, you don't control these voices that pop into your head. But also, it's a book, right? And so... When when we're told these things, our reaction to that is supposed to be like, oh, Larry, man, like you are a selfish prick. Uh-huh. Um, and, and like especially because, again, we have the dramatic irony of knowing, Larry, she's going to die. Your mother is going to die. And and that's all you're thinking about right, right. now is, oh, man, this is going to mess up my good time. I was I was going to get ready to go back to California and party. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the fact that he hates the voice though says something right it does it does yeah because that's it it says he wants to be better but maybe just doesn't have the tools yeah to get there right i mean i'm thinking about like if if you could hear my inner monologue every time that i had to wake up at at 1 43 a.m to change (laughs) a a dirty diaper oh yeah um uh, it, it would not reflect well on me but the fact is i did in fact get out of bed and change that dirty diaper right and and right like so 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 that's i i i can be somewhat hard on myself but not too hard right i think that's i think there's a there's a balance point there sure yeah i mean i i have a toddler i know i know all about what it's like to be like i love this kid more than anything in the world but jesus christ this is really (laughs) fucking up my day right now yeah right (laughs) yeah 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 all right so we leave larry behind uh with his mother you know kind of heading heading down um i I have a feeling that next week's reading matt is going to be just chock full of death i have a feeling you're right we're on the cusp of a lot of deaths here but we haven't quite gotten there all right so we have our final chapter of the week chapter 20 we're ending with franny um after the disastrous talk with her mother we see franny is attempting to write a letter to her friend catching her up on things because matt people still wrote uh, letters back then you know i've heard of them yeah yeah 
Uh, we see here that Franny is unable to adequately find the words to explain how she is feeling. She settles on something just like vague, uh, saying she's got problems, but they'll discuss them next time. Uh, I, particular interest to me is how she signs the letter, which is believe in me and I'll believe in you, um, Fran, which I believe you pointed out is a, a quote. Yeah, it's it's from Through the Looking Glass. And well, I think it's probably been reused in popular songs as well. Um, I believe, mm-hmm. but but I think originally it's from Al, it's from uh, Lewis Carroll's "Through the Looking Glass." Which but isn't that such an interesting way of putting your signature on a letter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think this is just more of Franny being kind of a, a fascinating, uh, a unique individual who's going to mm-hmm. p- put her own fingerprint on everything she touches. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I love it so much. Yeah. So the structure of this chapter is basically divided into three phone calls that Franny has received today. We we learn here at the very beginning that the first is good news, the second indifferent news, and the third is very, very bad news. So I kind of like how King lays out the structure of the chapter for us before we're real, even into it. Yeah, yeah. So that first call is from her friend, Debbie, who says that they love to have her move in with them. So we learn that Franny, despite what her father said, is getting the hell out of town. And I love the writing in this section here, Matt. If she could get away from this town where she had grown up, she thought she would be all right. Away from her mother, away from her father, even. The fact of the baby and her singleness would then assume some sort of sane proportion in her life. A large factor, surely, but not the only one. There was some sort of animal or bug or a frog, she thought, that swelled up to twice its normal size when it felt threatened. The predator, in theory at least, saw this, got scared, and slunk off. She felt a little like that bug. And it was this whole town, the total environment, gestalt, was maybe even a better word that made her feel that way. Uh, Love that. Love that so much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, I, I don't know. I just, Franny's inner, inner, inner monologue way of seeing the world just continues to be um, the most fun and also just one of the most like, like original, like she, she yeah. doesn't feel like any other character. I love that. I think you're to- solely right that it is distinct. Like you can tell when you're in Franny's head versus Stu's head versus Larry's head. Right. Um, King is, is an author, you know, especially this early in his career that is able to channel these character voices so distinctly and clearly. I really love it. Um, yeah. cause yeah, I, no other character in this book would, would process this particular situation this way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, And I just love the general idea of I'm going through this big fundamental change in myself and I'm terrified of the baby and what that means. And so uprooting my life and making a big, big, big change like dwarfs that one part of it in comparison, you know, like this idea of like do all the change at once. So each individual change doesn't feel as big and and all encompassing. I love it. Love it so much. Absolutely. So the second call comes from Jess. Um, He's checking up on her, basically asking if if he has any say in any of the decisions around the baby, uh, to which Franny basically says, no, go away. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like my takeaway was like, he's not asking in good faith. Like he's not Mm -hmm. saying like, it's my child. Don't I get a say in its well-being? Because the answer to that question would be yes, but I think both morally and legally. Uh, what he's actually saying is, why, why won't you get an abortion and make this problem go away for me? Yeah. Um, which, you know, he's he's saying it in a in a shitty, selfish way that tries to make him look good. But that's not what he's yeah. saying. I, I love the way Franny phrases it, right? Um, Jess was just being Jess, trying to protect his image of himself to himself, the way all thinking people do so they can get to sleep at night. That's wonderful. He's not like we've been talking about image and, and perception and and doing things for the sake of that. But in this case, like it's not even for other people. It's just for himself. Yeah, right. I, I think that's pretty key, actually, because I don't think I think that, uh, uh, you know, a character like Franny's mom is doing a similar thing where it's, it's really more about like being able to like knowing that, that you um, that you are who you think you are. Right. Like like the, the only way they can. The only way they know who they are is through the eyes of others. That's mm-hmm. that's like a key kind of weakness, actually. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's so great because I, I, it's not that Jess does anything like specifically wrong here, but I think you've totally picked up on what I think King wants you to pick up on, which is that he just comes off as kind of an ass yeah. anyway. Um, like, and, and I think 
I love the finality with which they leave this conversation, which is like Franny even thinks of it as finality. We can probably assume it's it's finality because statistically Jess is probably not going to live the next few days. Um, but but also like she just kind of realizes she's completely done with him. Yeah, right. So the final call, the bad one, was from Flanny, Franny's father. And just like Larry, Franny's mother has come down with a cold. Um, but we learn a little bit of more interesting things about Carla when her father is relaying this information of the cold. Um, he says, both of us knew she'd been invited to, she's been inviting something like this, Fran. She's president of the town historical committee. She's spending 20 hours a week at the library. She's secretary of the women's club and the lovers of literature club. She's been running the March of dimes here in town since before Fred died. And last winter she took on the heart fund for good measure. On top of all that, she's been trying to drum up interest in a Southern Maine genealogical society. Um, so I think it's very clear here that, you know, at least from the moment where she lost her son, perhaps before Carla kind of filled her life with as many possible things as she could. Right. Um, and it's not bad things, right? These are right. like on the surface, good things to be involved in. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting because like as much as we're tempted to dislike her, she has been doing a lot of good, hasn't yeah. she? Yeah. But 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 I but I kind of want to just for the sake of argument be a little bit less charitable and say aren't most of these things kind of skewed toward stuff that looks good, um, kind of more more just keeping up appearances. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, you're gonna maybe accidentally do some real good on your way to properly keeping up appearances, but I still feel like her key motivation is is um, the appearance of doing good. Yeah, being the person in town that is respected, like being being the very person that people could look at and be like, "Wow, look at all these things she's doing. Look how how does she do it?" You know, like yeah. being being perceived as that person in your town. I think right. you're right, and that might be a little uncharitable, but I mean, I I think I think Carla has earned a little bit of uncharity after she reacted to her daughter's pregnancy like that, yeah. which maybe we didn't spend enough time. We kind of got it wrapped up in 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 the writing, but like that's a really fucked up thing to do <laughs> have that kind of negative visceral reaction to your daughter going through something incredibly serious and scary yeah um it's really fucked up yeah well it's extremely selfish and yeah. and, and, and reveals a kind of childish mentality toward the whole yeah. world where it's like how could you do this to me mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. hey mom this is happening to me this is not yeah. happening to you this is not about you not everything is about you it's very narcissistic and selfish yeah so yeah so franny is sitting there feeling guilty for her role in her mother's illness because of course franny blames herself uh when the phone rings uh, a fourth time a fourth call and it's it's peter again and carla is much much worse um and I love how Franny frames this. I really like this, Matt. It's a pie, she told herself. Responsibility is a pie. Some of the responsibility goes with all the charity work she does. But you're only kidding if you think you're not going to have to cut a big, juicy, bitter piece for yourself and eat every bite. Um, I just love that imagery. And that's how she's choosing to kind of blame herself for what's happening to her mother, which is not, of course, not her fault at all. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I hope she doesn't put the curse in the pie and then leave the pie sitting on the counter. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody else eats a bite of the pie. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so our chapter and this week's reading ends with Peter heading to Franny to pick her up and head to the hospital to see Carla, who I think we know uh, is not is not gonna not gonna make it. No, nope. um, she's already having trouble breathing. So that's not it's not gonna be good. Yeah. The only question I have at this point is is Peter gonna come down with the virus, you know, eminently, or is he? Because it would be really interesting to me if Peter and Franny were both immune for some reason. I'm not saying I think that's going to happen. It just would be an interesting choice. Um, so we will see shortly, though. Yeah, well, I mean, presumably, like, I don't, if there is something that's granting immunity, it possibly is genetic, right? So it would make sense if people in the same family shared immunity it, it, it would make some amount of sense yeah i mean it seems like you know uh, uh larry larry's mom caught it but he didn't so it would make you know uh, it doesn't need to be you know rigorous right it's yeah it would make well, some we'll, amount of sense yeah. we'll see we, we yeah. just don't know we'll see yeah all right so that is the end of our reading this week oh man we've been going for a long time but as you said at the beginning of the show matt there was so much in there 
Um, and and I, uh, that brings us to our discussion question, and it brings us to a thing we have to say at the at the start of our discussion question. Um, we got a lot of answers <laughs> to this week's discussion question, Matt. I think part of that is just the general excitement of people. Uh, for the stand, which is great and exciting. Um, but part of that is just we've continued to grow as a show. We're, we're bigger than we were this time last year, and that's great. We want to keep growing. But we we talked about this before, that, that that we were going to eventually reach a point where we were getting so many discussion questions that uh, it just became not feasible for us to read them all in an, in a single episode. And I think we're kind of there now, because uh, if you look at your clock right now, folks, if you started listening to this podcast when you were driving into work and you are now driving to get lunch, that's because <laughs> we've been going on for uh-huh. a really long time. Yeah. And uh, if we had tried to answer ev- or to read every single answer to the discussion question this week, it would be another hour, hour and a half, which I know um, maybe you guys would enjoy that, but our voices would uh, explode and die yes. um, and we wouldn't be able to talk ever again so uh we've had to make some changes and i'm not saying we're going to do this for every episode because we might have some that have less answers than others but um matt what are we what are we kind of doing what, what was our plan here for how to do yeah. this so what i've done is i've i've uh whipped out the the old um computer coding um skills and just made a little ability to just choose 10 comment d- d- 10 answers randomly Mm-hmm. Um, not in the order in which they've been received, because that would really be kind of penalize people who who maybe felt like they were answering late. We're just going to pick ten, and and maybe we'll go up from ten. Maybe we'll go down from ten. I really can't promise anything at this point. Um, but it was you know we, we were getting to the point of spending an hour doing the discussion question reading. Yeah, which, but we we love we love the interaction. Um, it's just like it it uh, not sustainable. Yeah, I love I love the section of the show. I really do. Like yeah. We've gotten so many things added to our reading lists. It, it spurs on so many conversations. I definitely don't want to get rid of it. But yeah, it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, we, we on the on the last Black House episode, we had to cancel that because we went on for so long. We've gone on longer on this episode than we did on that one. Um <laughs> So we really just we had to do something. So yeah. we're still going to read them. We're still going to do it. So please keep sending them in. Also, they spur on discussion on the Reddit thread, which is great to see. Um, but yeah, we just can't read them all anymore. So this yeah. is this is our solution for now. We'll and we'll we'll keep assessing it as we go. Yeah, yeah. Please, please, you know, keep keep answering though. Yeah, we love it. There were like sixty something answers on the Reddit thread, and that doesn't account all y'all that emailed us. So, man, uh, wild. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. With that in mind, what was the question from last week, Matt? It was, uh, what would you do if Captain Trips were real? This was a dark question that we asked. Yeah. Um, some I people maybe kind of regret it. <laughs> some people definitely took it very seriously and some took it less so. But uh, sure. let's let's get through it. So um, uh, Walking Dude 22 says, um, basically, yeah, in the event that I were a survivor of Captain Trips, I would try to live quietly. I would stake claim to a library or a Barnes and Noble. I would consider the knowledge in books to be the most valuable asset in the long term. I would surround myself with um, those who are willing to help gather food and resources while providing security for my library. The specific goods I would trade in would be liquors, cigarettes, weed, anything addictive. It's not that I want to prey on people, but throughout history, people have used many things to feel okay. If I could corner those markets, then I could be a stabilizing force in the post-apocalyptic economy. Last summer, I read Go-Go Girls of the Apocalypse. It was fun. Don't judge me. It was the shortest read and an interesting take on the end of the world. I recommend it. On a tangential note, I've been listening to you, uh, to the Deconstructing Gladiator today. Um, yeah, we did we did a, an episode on Gladiator on uh, the Doofcast, our other podcast, for those of you who may be new. Um, I'm not going to read further because that was the end of the answer. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'll hole up in a Barnes and Noble and get a bunch of weed. <laughs> that is <laughs> great. Answer. That is an original answer. I love that. I love that. One one of the fun things about reading all these answers were we just kind of broadly asked the question, "What would you do if Captain Trips were real?" And we said you couldn't just say die, but a lot of people were like, like uh, Walking Dude said here, "Oh, so you mean if I sur- if I was one of the point six percent, right?" A uh-huh. lot of people assume that. Some people just assumed that they were just going to hole up and wait for themselves to die. And some people, like Walking Dude, were like, "I'm going to survive." I think it's really funny, like just the way people interpret that. Because I asked my wife the same question, and she would say, "Oh, well, I would, you know, start rebuilding society." And I was like, "Oh, so you're going to be one of the survivors?" She's like, "Yeah." <laughs> it's like even though it's only point six percent, she's like, "Yeah." 
definitely yeah. it's me um so i just <laughs> i think it's really funny how yeah. different people approach the, the question differently that is funny yeah <clears throat> gator switch says if captain trips were real i expect i would handle it similar to the t- similarly to how i dealt with covid i would make one enormous trip to the grocery store a trip to the liquor store and a trip to the dispensary that's two out of two questions that deal with weed <laughs> um <laughs> Most of what would I push, most of what I would purchase is sensible long term storage type food, but also a great cake from the bakery. Because if I'm gonna die, I may as well be die fat and happy. Then I would have one final meal at a takeout restaurant I love and didn't expect to visit again for a long time. Then I would hunker down in my home and wait shit out. No going out stores, no popping into a shop. I've done well over a hundred days straight in my home before, and I figure I could hide and wait it out again. After that, I have no idea. I assume my husband would survive with me, so then we'd scavenge for food and maybe go on some adventures. Can't imagine we'd really leave our current area unless there was a compelling reason. Some really inviting dream figures, perhaps. (laughs) Also, uh, reading this is still super relevant because COVID is not over. People are still getting sick and dying. Yeah, that is very true. I just got COVID, uh, and then I just got COVID. I got re-COVIDed, Matt, Uh three weeks ago. It came back. (sighs) Ridiculous. It's ridiculous of you. Um. So there's another person who thinks they're going to make it and wants yeah. to smoke some weed. Very optimistic. Very optimistic. I I want to say I <laughs> I agree with the whole let's get some drugs thing because I'm not a I'm not a, a drug user, Matt, really. Um I've I've smoked before. Shh, don't tell anyone. Um but I've never like used any of the hard drugs because I'm like terrified of the consequences of those things. But like if the world's ending, yeah, let's let's see what heroin feels like. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If there's it's consequence free, right? Let's it's got to I mean it's got to feel awesome. That's why people do it. So, yeah. Um, I, again, I told that to my wife and she was like, "But what if you live? Then you're just addicted to heroin." <laughs> it's like, "I'm not going to live. I'm going to die." Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the end of the world is one of those few situations where I would feel very very good about my choice to uh do heroin. Yes. Yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> I think the only situation. I don't think there's any more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I had like a terminal disease and I was going to die really soon, that's another one. But anyway. Yes. Yeah. I- imminent death. Yeah. Only time. Right. Right. Uh, Rear Admiral Bottom says, if trips were real, I would pack my entire family up in the car and sit in traffic on one of America's fine highways or tunnels. A few differences <laughs> between the editions. In the original, the, uh, the country Joe and the fish quote was instead Bob Dylan's shelter from the storm. Uh, the verse oh, that starts... Well, the deputy walks on hard nails. Um, so they go on from there to just yeah. list some other differences. Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, that, that's that's interesting. That's uh, I wouldn't have expected the, um, the uh, quotes to change. The yeah. quotes to change. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Anyway, yeah, that that's that's cool trivia. Yeah, just just get stuck in the car. That's that's just by far the most realistic. So you just be <laughs> I mean, one. That's of, definitely you, true. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be one of the extras in the, that's just that's just in in a car. Um, as like the as like the protagonist of the film is like we have to get out of here and the helicopter comes down and gets them and you're like well oh well mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> uh, something kooky says I can't say for sure how I would handle this type of pandemic I know I'd be avoiding people like the plague her <laughs> her but something like this is so incredibly transmissible that odds are good that the damage would be done before people knew to quarantine I guess I would try to get as in as much family time as possible as I know I'm the weakest link in my household and will probably be the first to go. Oh, that's that's sad. See, yeah. some of people answered this and made me feel bad for asking the question. Yeah, I tried to prepare my kids as best I could for survival in a pandemic world and spend as much time together as we could. Yeah, that's beautiful and sad. And I'm sorry for asking this question. Right. I mean, it's like, it's, hey, man, it's the subject matter of the book. Don't blame us. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it is. It is. Uh, it, it, we did just go through a pandemic. So, you know, yeah. not our fault. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emperor Fry the Solid says um, they read the stand during the first week of COVID and they've had a lot of time to think about this. Oh. And they say, I think I'd just be alone, S- uh, steal all the weed from my local <laughs> stores, <laughs> get real fat, die the first winter. Maybe I'll finally get through all the books lingering on my to read shelf. Sounds kind of relaxing. This is related, but my wife's been watching a show on Netflix called Alone. Have you ever heard of the show? My parents are addicted to this show, um, <laughs> and they now have gotten my oldest daughter addicted to the show as well. It's kind of incredible in that I don't understand how people survived like without 
all the shit that we have now. Uh-huh. Like it's just so for those that don't know, the concept is it's like a reality TV show where ten contestants are literally just like dropped in the middle of nowhere. Um, they're allowed to like choose ten items that they can bring with them. Um, and they have their own camera set up, so they're responsible for filming themselves, and they just try to survive. And if they get too hungry or unsafe, they can hit a button, and then they will get come picked up. And the last one standing wins half a million dollars, which uh-huh. is a bigger prize than most reality TV shows have, uh, because they're actually having to do incredible stuff. Um, it's strangely addictive, but like. I just thinking of of Emperor Fry, the solids answer that got me thinking yeah. of that show. Well, yeah, because a lot of them break down just out of loneliness. It's not even yeah. oh, um, yeah. it's not even starvation. I mean, a lot of a lot of the time it is. A lot of the time they're they're physically miserable. But some of the time they're just like, I can't take this anymore. I'm, I'm going insane. And they yeah. On the, on the current season, this one guy came. He came very overweight, but uh, he's so far lost seventy five pounds over the course of fifty days, which is insane. Um, yeah, so he's just not getting any protein at all because because turns out uh, being a human in this world <laughs> trying to survive really sucks. Yeah, we're not made to survive on our own. Right. And it, to exist in society. And it also turns out like all the stuff that you have to do to survive t- burns a ton of calories. That's uh-huh, another, uh-huh. another thing that you don't necessarily think about. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Um, that's on Netflix. If anyone wants to watch that show, it's it's a pretty interesting watch, actually. Yeah. All right, uh, Pear Jane says, this is a dark question. Yes, sorry, Jane. Uh, and one I'm not really ready to answer in this forum. Suffice to say, I would hope my last days would be bringing co- comfort to my children. If I survive, that brings me to a greater point. You talked a lot about how King writes about the children affected by the superfood plague. And of the characters we met, they're all essentially alone. Fran is pregnant, but none of them have families of their own. And he makes a point of showing how alone they all feel. At the time of this writing, King had small children of his own. How do survivors survive their children? How do children survive their parents in such an empty world? Do survivors who can rebuild necessarily need to have had different scale of loss in order to just function? Yeah, these are good questions um, that I think we should keep in mind as a uh, as we go through the coming weeks. Right, because you're you're not only dealing with the immediate emergency, but you're dealing with unprecedented horrible grief as well. Right, and I, I would expect that that will be part of this story. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm like, okay, says if trips were real, I would probably go to the, the Station Eleven route and try to link up with the traveling band of people who share my interests. Not big on instruments and Shakespeare, but hopefully I can find some other horror book nerds who like cross stitch who didn't die of the terrifying uh, sounding bloated neck virus. Yikes. I read it, the stand a few times and every time it starts off describing the nasty mucus globs and tire neck, I get all horrified all over again. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty gross. Like you said, and, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, station 11, um, one of them is sort of a middle ground between dark and, and, and optimistic actually. Um, I, I guess I, I don't know where the stand is going to fall, uh, on that axis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I do, but I have to pretend like I right, don't. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, Gerardo says, if we had Captain Trips, my biggest desire would be to get back to my family in the Northeast. But if I was infected, I'd go camping, swimming, biking, and reading. Do my favorite things until I die or survive. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. I wish I wish it wouldn't take a, a super flu to make us do our favorite things, right? Uh-huh. I, wish, <laughs> I wish we could just do our favorite things. Yeah, I like camping. I don't think I've camped in like four years or something. Oh, well. <laughs> Anyway, uh, bon, bon, uh, Boner six 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 four twenty. I love that name. I know we've seen him before, but I yeah. just I just love it. They say I would do exactly what I did when COVID rocked up on us: stock up on art supplies and guitar strings, make sure my Steam library is up to date, and ensure I've got plenty of jazz cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> How many fucking people? Hope, all of our listeners going to be smoking weed. <laughs> all of our listeners, Scott. What does that say about us? Um, they say I'm certainly gonna. Uh, miss going to bars and seeing gnarly bands with my friends but i'm an introverted only child with many solitary hobbies so i'm pretty well equipped for any for another goddamn quarantine hopefully games workshop doesn't immediately sell out of tyranid minis because i'll need them just me and my bugs and then of course i would die zero six zero point six percent survival rate baby (laughs) oh yeah man warhammers would be a great hobby if you just were going to be alone for the rest of your life 
Sure. Just painting Warhammers, <laughs> man. Like, like you, cause that's a task that never ends. <laughs> I can tell, I can tell that's, I'm not speaking to I'm your soul to- here. I'm totally with you on this one, dude. You just, yeah. you, you feel me boner six, 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 four twenty. I know you do. <laughs> Uh, last but not least, we have complicated 9519 who says, okay, I got a couple th- different things I do if captain trips were real, depending on the situation. Situation one, if I didn't know about it and got infected first, I'd simply die. <laughs> Touche. Situation two, if I knew captain trips was real and knew I would die, I'd quit my job, take my wife and burn up all the money on fun vacations and shit until I got symptoms and then die. Situation three, I'm immune to captain trips. I survived the beginning of the apocalypse and I suddenly have to get real smart about a lot of things real quick. 3.1, I end up dying of starvation or from a bunch of punks who wanted my loot. 3.2, I become a man of the land, surviving, thriving, super depressed. I don't know how One Piece ends, but doing my best to survive. Man, you worked anime into that answer somehow. That's impressive. Bonus points for you, complicated. Uh-huh. Wow. You get an A. That's, uh, I didn't think we were going to get it, but there it was. No. We almost had an anime-free week, and uh, <laughs> and there it goes. Yep. Um, so thank you all for those answers. Like we said, we only picked 10 of your many, many, many answers. So uh, if you didn't get picked this time, apologies. It, like we said, it was completely random. Matt literally wrote a script that did it, so uh, we're not like targeting – to ignore you or targeting people totally totally random um and uh keep sending those those questions those answers in it's great speaking of spending answers in uh we got a we got a new question to discuss next week and what is that question matt this week's question is who's your favorite complicated family yeah i think Um, we mean in storytelling and literature right in Um, in, in literature movies books uh tv um we got a lot of complicated families in this book matt uh, a lot of them they're everywhere mother daughter yep father daughter mother son um There's, all over the place yeah the, the, no siblings that i can think of but sibling is another fun mm-hmm. uh anyway yeah I'm, I'm sure i'm sure there's a wide variety of answers for this one yeah definitely um so that is it finally for this week's episode um we're gonna have to get a, a rain on these things matt this is one of the longest episodes we've done in a long time um but uh hopefully it'll calm down next week because i'm sure that the book is just going to be less stuffed with great things going yeah. forward yeah the plot's going to slow down from this point mm-hmm. yeah so next week our coverage of the stand will continue with chapters 21 through 28 of the novel um just a note for those of you that might be new there is a a uh, a link in every show notes to a spreadsheet that has the complete schedule so if you're ever wondering what chapters we're reading what week you can simply open up the show click on uh the schedule in the show notes and you will know also uh, we do have a calendar at doofmedia.com slash calendar that will show uh all the episodes into the future and what uh what chapters will be covered for that week so multiple places to find that out yeah, absolutely. Uh, remember, you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com uh, or on Twitter at kingslingerspod or over on the subreddit on, uh, at r slash doofmedia. That's a great place to answer the discussion question. Absolutely. Um, and if you're not our, uh, blah, blah, if you're not already subscribed to Kingslingers, folks, this is why we don't go on for much longer than this because we're losing all ability to form words. Uh-huh. Anymore. If you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, we strongly recommend you do so, so you will never miss a a single solitary episode, including a bunch of bonus episodes that we sometimes release in which we read your stories for Do the King Thing, because it's it's coming. It's coming again. Uh, You can find us anywhere that podcasts are to be found. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and, uh, and join us on our journey through the stand. Uh, yeah, and if you like uh, Kingslingers and you want to support us, then please head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia. Uh, this week we have new patrons Richard and Hans. Uh, welcome. We hope you appreciate the cool content we have over there on the Patreon. There's just a, there's really a ridiculous amount of stuff, frankly, at this point. Um, it's really quite uh, quite massive. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Yeah. Um, and of course, if you cannot afford to donate, that is always okay. Please help us by sharing this podcast with all your Stephen King loving friends. And as always, please help us by leaving a rating and reviews on 
the podcast platform that you listen to this show on. This week's spotlight review comes from Doc Rasnake, who gives us five stars and says, Slinging terrific stuff. I stumbled onto this podcast through Audible after a binge listen of the Dark Tower series over the past year. The podcast was a wonderful wrap up after finishing all the books. Their deep dive into the characters and themes definitely added to the experience. It has taken me a while to catch up to real time with the show content, but I just finished Black House in real time along with the show. I'd never finished Black House with my first read back in 2001. The first 50 pages about the territories or jack lost me and i set it aside until now thanks to the show i finished it and loved the way the short story unfurled thanks to the host for that i'm now gearing up through a third for a third tour through the world of the stand my first in nearly 20 years i'm looking forward to having matt and scott along for the wide ride great show guys well thank you so much doc um that's great to hear i i am so happy that we allowed you to get through uh, a very difficult first 50 pages of Black House into a rather wonderful book that awaited you on the other side. That, yeah. that makes me so happy. Yeah, we we felt similarly on both counts, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so thank you, Doc, and thank you to everyone who has taken the time to send those in. We really do appreciate it. They're great to read, and they do help us uh, find new listeners. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, we've reached the end finally, Matt. That is going to do it for us this week. My voice held out. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be doing that podcast tomorrow, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but we will be back next week with Arrested Voices ready to go through the rest of the stand. Once again, it'll be chapters 21 through 28. I can't wait to discuss it with you, Matt. It's, it's, it's only going to get better from here. Awesome. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Mm-hmm.